Hello again YouTube, this video is going to be a bit different to my previous Rings of Power videos in that I'm not chronologically analyzing any particular episode. I am instead going to cover areas that have been outside of the scope of my previous videos, revisit some moments from earlier episodes that have now been recontextualized, and I am going to provide something of a conclusion and give my final thoughts on the show. I will not be providing full references to all of my claims in this video because I have about 10 hours of references in my previous videos which you can check out if you have not already. This video should mostly make sense without having seen the previous ones, but if you would like full context for everything I am about to cover, I strongly suggest starting from episode 1. Just in case you have not seen any of my previous videos, let me state that I am not drawing directly from Tolkien's books at any point. My objective is to critique Rings of Power as an independent piece of filmmaking and storytelling. If something I say is incorrect because it goes against something in Tolkien's books, I simply don't care because that is not my criteria for deconstructing this show. With that said, let me begin by making a couple of corrections where I think I may have got things wrong. The point of these videos was never simply to be a dunking contest, so I think it is probably good practice to acknowledge where I made some mistakes, or was simply too harsh. In episode 6, I argued that Waldreg should not have been able to escape during the Numenorean cavalry charge. Given that the Numenoreans would have perceived him to be a peasant, and they do not know that he is evil, this is actually quite possible. I still think it should have been shown, but I will rescind it as a criticism of the plausibility of the sequence of events. I also argued that Galadriel cannot have known that the volcano was part of any kind of evil plan. However, she did discover from the convenient spy who left a piece of paper in Numenor that Sauron planned to create a realm where evil would thrive. Given what actually happens to the Southlands after the eruption, in that it decimates the entire region and creates a realm where evil can thrive rather than, you know, acting like an actual volcanic eruption, I think it is plausible that Galadriel would have seen this as part of some kind of evil plan. There is still absolutely no way she could have known exactly how this happened, but I'm happy to accept that she considers the eruption to be part of a plan. And in episode 4, I argued that the whole Guildcrest scenario was flawed because I was assuming that it functioned as a means of proving a qualification, whereas it is entirely possible that it was more of a work permit. Farazon giving Halbrand a work permit and him using it to get a job is coherent and does make sense. I also missed that in their final scene, Elendil was noticing the black flags and was unsure how he was going to tell Muriel that her father had died. There are also a couple of things I was unsure about but can now confirm. In episode 2, Bronwyn refers to Osterith as the Elven Tower which suggests that it was built by the elves and not by Sauron. This means that the existence of the sword key dam mechanism is simply an unexplained mystery, particularly when the sword was forged supposedly by Sauron. Now then, there is also something I missed which I am very much excited to confirm for you now. In the very first scene with Arendir before he walks into the pub, Waldreg and the Cowgoo Man are discussing the poisoning. Poison more likely. Poison? By who? Waldreg then attempts to give Arendir a report, avoiding mentioning the poisoning as he does not want him to know about it. Arendir then directly asks him about the poisoning. And the poisoning? What poisoning? The one we were just discussing. This is explicit confirmation from the show that Arendir has extremely good hearing because he was outside the tavern when they were discussing the poisoning. Whether or not he has truly supernatural hearing in the same way that he has supernatural vision is irrelevant, because all I needed was for the show to confirm that his hearing is anything other than awful, because now I can say with certainty that him being snuck up on four separate times during season one is absolutely an error. So with those corrections out of the way, let's get going with the final autopsy of season one. Can we tell what was deliberate and what was not? This is an idea that entered my mind multiple times during the series because the writers seem to have this fascinating habit of depicting something which has what appear to be unintended consequences. I am going to explore a few of these now. So, in the opening scene, what the writers wanted to do was to show Galadriel as being an outsider who is better than the other kids, but doesn't really have any friends and is therefore not particularly happy. What actually happens, though, is that Galadriel was set up to be a violent asshole as a child, and yet is supposed to be a sympathetic character. Had she been depicted as overcoming this hot-headed, selfish, and impulsive behavior as she grew into adolescence, then this would have worked far better. 
However, she continues to be an arsehole throughout the series and for the most part is consistently presented as someone with whom we are meant to sympathize. Additionally, we learn later in the episode that she considered her childhood to be an indescribably blissful time of pure joy, a perspective that she explicitly states not once but twice. And we quite clearly see this to not be the case. Unless, of course, she considers beating other children into submission to be the best feeling imaginable, which although I can believe to be the case given what we know about this character, this is of course not the writer's intent because of how the other characters react to her. The one single time when Galadriel is acknowledged to be a disgusting psychopath is when she is interrogating Adar, and that perspective is very much short-lived. In the troll fight, what the writers wanted to do was depict Galadriel overcoming an obstacle that her soldiers were unable to overcome without her. The principal idea here is that she arrives heroically to save the day. This sequence also establishes the relative power levels of elves as well as Galadriel herself. And the scene uses a snow troll to do this, which has never been seen before, however audience members will be very aware of the cave troll in the Fellowship of the Ring, which I assume is why the writers decided to have this happen. What actually happens in the scene, however, is Galadriel and Thondir arrive and see the other elves being annihilated by the troll, then they wait around for about 10 seconds before doing anything, and then Thondir catapults Galadriel at the troll with his sword, and she single-handedly kicks its ass. Therefore, the scene communicates multiple things which were not what the writers could have intended. We learn that Galadriel and Thondir do not show any particular urgency regarding saving the lives of their companions. This would be consistent with what we had learned previously about Galadriel, again unintentionally, but this scene also tells us that Thondir doesn't particularly care about his men either. Given that immediately following this scene, both Thondir and the other soldiers all mutiny against Galadriel, this doesn't really make much sense. We also see that Galadriel doesn't need any help from anyone, even when doing something as difficult, supposedly, as defeating a troll. This is reinforced repeatedly throughout the series. Galadriel is depicted as a lone wolf who doesn't need anyone. She can handle it all by herself. And the reason why I do not believe this to be intentional is because a major plot point is that she believes she was sent to Valinor as a result of wanting to ask for more soldiers to continue her quest. She quite clearly does not need more soldiers because they literally accomplish nothing during this entire sequence. Every single discovery or action that occurs during this prologue would have happened in precisely the same way if Galadriel was there entirely on her own. She works everything out and kills the monster all by herself. And yet, she also wants more soldiers and later an entire army from Numenor, which I will get to soon, don't you worry. In the mutiny scene, which comes afterwards, what the writers wanted to do was have the heroic Galadriel be abandoned by her cowardly, useless underlings who have conspired to betray her. We know this because the tone of the scene is very dramatic and intense, indicating that what they are doing is wrong. I mean, just listen to this music. What actually happened here, though, is that after following Galadriel for hundreds of years and having their lives repeatedly put at risk seemingly without any consideration from her, they have hit their breaking point and refuse to continue on this insane and baseless quest for vengeance. We later learn that continuing their search would have been against the orders of the High King, and that therefore it was in fact Galadriel who was out of line, but as the audience we do not know this at this point, meaning that, from the perspective of the audience during this mutiny, all of the information we have points to Galadriel being the one at fault, and the mutiny is both reasonable and totally justifiable. Once again, because Galadriel is the main character, it will of course turn out that she was right the whole time, and the elves never should have left her. Also, I didn't really know where else to put this, so I'll just slide this in here. We see in this shot that there are 16 elves accompanying Galadriel, and in this subsequent shot we see that there are now 9. This means that over the course of the centuries-long blood oath for vengeance, it is not unlikely that multiple elves have died, and yet no one appears to acknowledge this. We don't get a line from Thondir where he says, come on, we've already lost half our company, we need to go home. And the reason we don't get that line, despite it being a perfectly reasonable thing to say, is because this would force Galadriel to reply with something to the effect of, I don't care which of course the writers don't want Galadriel to ever be forced to say, despite her actions requiring her to have this mindset. So I was going to list more examples of this, but I think I've made my point. These are three examples from the first 15 minutes of episode one. There are many, many more scenes that function in a similar manner. The writers clearly have an objective, which we can deduce based on where the story goes and the reactions of the characters involved, and yet they consistently make basic mistakes which cause compounding issues further down the road. 
Some of you may be familiar with the idea of death of the author, which I would define as something along the lines of saying that authorial intent is irrelevant when viewing a piece of art. It might be interesting to know what the writers wanted to do or how they approached a particular scene, but their perspective does not change what the scene actually is. So, whilst I don't particularly care what the writers wanted to achieve with each scene, I do nonetheless find it very interesting how, with staggering frequency, they failed to realize their goals. Is it a problem for characters to be unlikable assholes? The obvious answer is no. The reason that this is a topic I wanted to touch on, though, is that a substantial portion of my criticism could be reductively summed up as X character is an asshole. So I wanted to explain why, in the case of Rings of Power, this is a detriment, whereas in other shows it may not be. There are plenty of characters in movies and TV shows that are self-centered, egotistical, arrogant morons. Without a doubt, my favorite comedy show is It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and all five of the main cast of characters could be described in this way. It's an open and shut case, and anybody who can't see that mm. is a savage and an idiot! So, why is it a problem when certain characters in Rings of Power act in dis disgusting ways. Well, a key difference between Rings of Power and Always Sunny is that Always Sunny is aware that its characters are reprehensible. To be more specific, the world of the show reacts as if those characters are reprehensible. In the case of Always Sunny, this is absolutely the intent of the writers because the writers are, of course, aware of how disgusting their characters are. This may sound semantic, but I don't particularly care if the writers of the show are aware of the fact that their characters are disgusting people because their awareness, or lack of, does not not directly affect the quality of the show. Hello again, death of the author. In practice, however, if the writers are unaware of what kinds of people inhabit the world of their show, this will lead to other negative consequences, many of which are manifest in Rings of Power. Let's use Dennis Reynolds from Always Sunny as an example. D, you gangly, uncoordinated bitch. I am not getting hogged tied over your lack of grace. He is a manipulative psychopath with serious anger issues, which sounds remarkably similar to a certain character in Rings of Power. There is a tempest in me. I am untethered and my rage knows no bounds! The other characters in Always Sunny are frequently disgusted or shocked by Dennis's behavior, even though they themselves can be just as badly behaved, if not worse. Side characters that are not the central gang almost universally react to Dennis as a person might in real life. They distance themselves from him the moment they realize the kind of person he is. I would like to go in your room. Uh, and I suspect that maybe you might say no, and yet I also feel like maybe you wouldn't dare. No one comes away from watching Always Sunny thinking Dennis is a good person, and a huge amount of the comedy from the show comes from watching these insane, depraved sociopaths constantly screwing each other over in some of the most inhumane and unsympathetic ways imaginable, as well as watching ordinary people react to this insanity. D, mm. I swear you would be of more use to me if I skinned you and turned your skin into a lampshade. Are you saying that you have a collection of skin luggage? Of course I'm not, D. Don't be ridiculous. Think of the smell. You haven't thought of the smell, you bitch! This is not depicted as positive behavior in spite of it being frequently hilarious. There are other examples that are worth mentioning, including Arthur Fleck in Joker and Lewis Bloom in Nightcrawler. Neither one of them are good people, and Joker and Nightcrawler do not hide this fact. Both movies follow their protagonists as they become more and more unhinged, and in both cases, the world reacts accordingly. Both films are told from the perspective of their main characters, and as such, they may come across as condoning their behavior, but if you walked out of Joker thinking that you should behave like Arthur, then something is very seriously wrong with you. Now, to compare characters like Dennis, Arthur, and Lewis to someone like Galadriel. So because I'm going to fully list Galadriel's character traits later in this video, I will not do so now. I will simply make the claim that Galadriel is a rude, selfish, arrogant bitch who threatens genocide and does not care about anything beyond her own quest for murder. This doesn't sound so different to Dennis, Arthur, or Lewis, does it? Dennis Reynolds is an incredibly vain, deranged, and delusional man who is possibly a serial killer and is absolutely psychopathic. Dude, what's all that stuff you're grabbing? Tools! Tools! <laughs> Duct tape, zip ties, and gloves! I have to have my tools! Arthur Fleck is a murderous and unhinged criminal, and Lewis Bloom is also an unfeeling psychopath who leverages power over other people in order to get what he wants. Blackmail, assault, and indirectly killing people are not beyond him. So, why am I saying that it's a problem for Galadriel to behave in this way when I would not say the same for any of these other characters? Critically, Rings of Power does not denounce Galadriel's behavior. 
Rings of Power does not even simply depict this behavior. Worse still, it praises it. Galadriel is portrayed in-universe as a good person who is worthy of admiration. The one single time when she is acknowledged as going too far is when she threatens genocide and centuries of torture, remember this is the protagonist we're talking about, and Sauron, of all people, pulls her back and defuses the situation. The only two characters I can think of who do not admire Galadriel are Gilgalad, because she keeps disobeying him, and Elendil, for reasons that are incredibly confused. Throughout the show, Galadriel is depicted as doing what needs to be done, spurred on by her troubled past. She does what no one else can, and she is so profoundly dedicated to saving the world that she doesn't have time for kind words and pleasantries. She is such a good person, so heroic and noble. That is what I think this character was supposed to be. The character we got... well... You're gonna have to wait until a little bit later in this video to get my full rundown of Galadriel. Anyway, Galadriel's incredible selfishness and unfettered pridefulness causes everything that happens later involving Sauron and the One Ring. I want to draw a parallel here specifically to Walter White from Breaking Bad. I will not spoil anything, so I will be as vague as I can whilst still making the point. In the season 4 finale, it is revealed that Walter has done something horrible for entirely self-serving reasons, much like Galadriel in the finale of Rings of Power. Arguably, what Galadriel did was even worse. Although her actions did not directly harm anyone, the potential for harm caused by her actions is catastrophic. So, why am I claiming it to be bad writing that Galadriel is an evil bitch when I would praise Walter White being a similarly terrible person? Well, there are a few reasons. In a pure judgment of character, Walter White has some redeeming qualities. With Galadriel, these are virtually non-existent. Walter White is a fully fleshed out and believable person. Galadriel is a cardboard cutout that is puppeteered by the script. In Breaking Bad, there are consequences to Walter White's actions in the following season. Given the quality of season one and the general lack of consequences for anything, which I will be getting to soon, I think it is safe to say that there will be no consequences for Galadriel making this decision. Probably most critically, however, Walter White is very much aware of what he did. He knowingly and willingly took this action and he justified it as being acceptable to himself. It was a means to an end, and it was worth the risk. He does not consider this to be an evil act, or at the very least, he considers it to be a necessarily evil act. With Galadriel, she doesn't even seem to realize what she has done. All of the pieces are there, but no character ever addresses it. This means that either this was not the writer's intention, and they are totally incompetent, or it means that Galadriel is incredibly unintelligent, meaning that our options are that Galadriel is an idiot, or that she is terribly written. When we look at the season as a whole, however, it becomes clear that she is in fact a terribly written idiot. So, now that I have hopefully adequately established that Rings of Power is seemingly unaware of how psychotic and reprehensible some of its characters are, Let's revisit the character notes that I have been compiling throughout my videos so that we can finalize what the show actually tells us about each character. I'm going to go through each character in varying amounts of detail, starting with the ones with the least screen time and finishing with the main characters. I am also going to place them on a tier list that I made just for a bit of fun. As you can probably guess, most of the characters in this show are bad, or at the very least inoffensive, so a traditional S, A, B, C, D, E tier list would not really make any sense, as the top three categories would never be used. So I have decided to use the following tiers. Mostly functional, which is going to be for the best characters in the show that serve their purpose and don't really have any problems. The inoffensive characters, which are the ones that maybe are a bit boring, but there's nothing hugely wrong with them, but nothing particularly good about them either. The bad characters, which are going to be your cookie cutter bad characters. The terrible characters, which are the ones with pretty serious flaws or inconsistencies. The characters that break the show, which I'm reserving for the absolute worst of the worst. And I've also added a non-character tier, which is essentially my version of not applicable. They're not characters, we know nothing about them, and they exist for seemingly no reason. So rather than grade them somewhere on here, I thought I'd put them down here in non-character. So, starting us off, the character with the least amount of screen time in Rings of Power is the Balrog. The Balrog isn't really a character, but I wanted to include it anyway. The Balrog appears on the screen for 10 seconds, if we exclude the animated story sequence in episode 5. The Balrog serves absolutely no narrative purpose. It appears purely as a cheap cliffhanger and as a hook for season 2. It does not do anything, and it has no character traits other than evil. So the Balrog, I think, goes pretty firmly into non-character. Again, it serves no purpose, and it I mean, it isn't a character. 
Now for the first actual character with the least screen time is Galadriel's brother Finrod, with 2 minutes and 53 seconds, which is approximately the duration that Haldir appeared for in The Lord of the Rings. I am excluding Finrod's appearance in Episode 8, as that was Sauron in disguise. Finrod is essentially a plot device. He exists only to motivate Galadriel, and to therefore be the catalyst that begins the story of Rings of Power. He does, however, have a few character traits. We learn that he taught Galadriel how to make the boat that she plays with in the opening scene, and he clearly appears to love his sister and their parents. He is also brave and devoted to protecting Valinor and the elves. This is extremely thin, and he also delivers not one but two somewhat questionable metaphors that the show has become rather infamous for, but his reasons for doing what he does are solid, and the character is, I would argue, entirely believable and consistent. Alright, Finrod, I'm actually going to put him up here in Mostly Functional. I don't have a problem with Finrod, he says a couple of silly things, but if saying a couple of silly things means that you can't be in Mostly Functional, then I may as well delete this category. Okay, next up is King Tar Palantir, the crazy old ex-king of Numenor and Muriel's father. He appears on screen for four minutes and one second, and due to his very deteriorated mental state, we learn very little about him through his own actions, and are primarily informed about him from the other characters discussing the history of Numenor. Tar Palantir believed that the Numenorians had angered the Valar, and was very committed to his loyalty with the elves, and was unwilling to change his ways in spite of his people not sharing this view. This resulted in him being dethroned. He has since seemingly driven himself mad by using the Palantir obsessively. So, as a character, this guy I think is mildly interesting, but again, he is barely a character. If we only take the scenes in which he actually does things, then the show uses him as a crazy old man who is just crazy enough to move the scenes in the direction that the writers want them to go in. Anything interesting about this character is entirely from his backstory that we learn about through other characters, not him. As a result, this character could be deleted from the show, and absolutely nothing would change. All right, King of Numenor, you're going, you're going in non-character. You're just too conveniently crazy for me to put you anywhere else. Next up is Tamar, who is not named in the show, but you will remember him as the racist wannabe politician troublemaker. Tamar appears for 5 minutes and 35 seconds, and actually has a little bit to him. He clearly takes an interest in the politics of Numenor, even if for nefarious or self-serving or nonsensical reasons. He is a member of the Workers' Guild, and appears to enjoy partying, and seems to be more than competent as a speaker. However, he also despises elves, whilst acknowledging that elves are physiologically superior to men, and he dislikes the previous king due to his love of elves, believes that people's character is derived from the quality of their breeding, and considers violent retribution outside of the law to be justifiable and necessary. The function of this character is to establish Halbrand's need for a guild crest and to allow him to violently subdue them and end up in prison without us feeling too bad about it, because at this point we do not know that Halbrand is Sauron and the guy he's beating up seems to be a caricature of right-wing nationalists. He also serves as a gateway drug to Farazon, who seems to hold very similar views but appears to be vastly more influential and competent, thus establishing Farazon as a significant antagonistic force in Numenor. Okay, Tamar, buddy, you're going in inoffensive. I don't really have a huge amount of problems with the character himself, he's just incredibly thin. Okay, next up we have Medhor, Arendir's friend from the Elven Garrison who dies after his superior antagonizes their captors, more on that later. Medhor is on screen for 5 minutes and 35 seconds. He essentially functions in life as an exposition dumper and in death as a means of communicating that the orcs are evil savages. We do also learn, however, that he is committed to his job, he is apparently unhygienic, and that he tries to look out for Arendir. Ultimately though, he is nothing more than a red shirt, dying through no fault of his own, in a way that was unnecessary and honestly undeserved. Okay, Medhor, you're also going in inoffensive. There's basically nothing to you. You're just man who talks and then dies. But I can't. You're not bad, honestly. When you guys see who I'm putting in bad, you'll see what I mean. Medhor's not bad. Now, we have the utter imbecile star of episode 5, Kemen, who appears on screen for a total of 7 minutes and 12 seconds. This is approximately the duration that Grima Wormtongue appeared for in The Lord of the Rings. Kemen is a character that exists for one single purpose to allow Isildur to trick his father into letting him join the army. He presumably will have a different purpose in Season 2, as we have had no hint whatsoever that there will be any consequences for him destroying multiple Numenorean military assets. Kemen is a character that has one single motivator, Aarian's Lady Garden. 
Kemen's narrative arc in season one of Rings of Power is that he thinks Aarian is hot, so he hits on her a couple of times, and is evidently to some degree successful. She then makes clear to him that she is against the war, causing him to raise these concerns to his father Farazon, suggesting that Kemen is more than willing to try and exploit his father's position of influence to get what he wants. After Farazon is unreceptive, he decides instead to blow up the Numenorean fleet. Therefore, Kemen's character can be summed up in pretty much three statements. Kemen thinks with his dick. Kemen is willing to vandalize military equipment and risk the lives of everyone nearby in order to get into some sweet moist pantaloons. And Kemen is extremely selfish and stupid. All right, Kemen. Kemen doesn't break the show because, again, he only really serves one purpose, but Kemen is absolutely goddamn terrible. Um, if there was more to him and he took up more of the show, he would absolutely be down here, but I'm going to stick him here for now. Next up is Rowan, who appears for 7 minutes and 29 seconds. Rowan is a character who accomplishes two things. He acts as an embodiment of the racial tensions between elves and men, and his death informs us of how evil Waldreg and Adar actually are. Rowan despises elves, is extremely cowardly, and appears to be terrified of orcs, but is also seemingly enthusiastic about defecting and joining the orcs. He is also a comically terrible liar, and is an idiot for thinking anyone would believe him when he lied about where Theo was. Alright, Rowan... Rowan is bad, he's absolutely a douchebag and he's an idiot, but he doesn't really impact anything, so I'm not going to put him any lower than bad. Then we have Thondir, who is on screen for 7 minutes and 33 seconds, all entirely in episode 1. Thondir appears to be Galadriel's second in command on her quest to find Sauron, and exists primarily to act as a foil to Galadriel. He repeatedly tries to convince her to end her quest and return home, and we later learn that the reason he did this was because by continuing their search for Sauron, they were disobeying their High King. He is very loyal to Gilgalad, and also to Galadriel, given that he has been serving under her for presumably centuries. He considers Galadriel to be unreasonable in her certainty that Sauron is still out there, and he raises multiple logically consistent objections to Galadriel's deductions. As Thondir is not the main character, however, he is revealed to be the unreasonable one, as Galadriel was, of course, right all along. Thondir, like Galadriel, does not appear to care much, if at all, for the lives of his men. Yes, he is the guy presumably voicing the concerns of the other soldiers directly to her, and suggesting that they abandon their quest and return home. But the reason he is doing this is because they were currently disobeying their High King. We also see Thondir not take any care of the guy who nearly gets left behind in the blizzard, and he also of course stands there like a lemon and watches his soldiers get beaten to a pulp by the troll. Okay, Thondir I'm gonna put in inoffensive. He... He would be up here if not for the lack of concern that he shows for his men, and honestly, the point of his character kind of requires that he cares about his men. So he's going to go in inoffensive because, I mean, he points out how wrong Galadriel is, but unfortunately the script can't let him be right. So, Aarian is pretty much a nothing burger of a character. She doesn't really do anything in her 8 minutes and 6 seconds of screen time. She only facilitates other people doing things. As such, there aren't really a huge amount of things to criticize about her other than that she is not in any way compelling or interesting. She exists as a motivation for Kemen, as an audience perspective into some of the goings-on in Numenor, and finally as a cliffhanger when she is steered into the direction of the Palantir by a crazy old man. In terms of her actual character, we learn that she is very much against the war. She is curious and inquisitive, and she goes out of her way to help people. She also does not like the fact that Galadriel is in Numenor, tries to encourage her brother Isildur to be more responsible, and talks back to her father in a sarcastic manner regarding his parenting skills. As the season makes clear, however, she is pretty much correct in her assertion that Elendil doesn't actually listen to Isildur, so I can't really fault what she is saying. Okay, Aarian, you're going in inoffensive again. There's nothing really to you. There's nothing good, nothing bad. You're just kind of there. Next up is Nori's sister, Dilly, who appears on screen for 8 minutes and 8 seconds. Dilly does not do anything. Dilly walks up to a tree, and it falls on her. That is the summation of Dilly's impact on Rings of Power. Nori did not need to have a younger sister. The only reason Dilly exists is so that Gandalf could drop a tree on her so that he could then be exiled. Alright, Dilly, you are absolutely a non-character. I have absolutely no idea why this character is in the show. She's so inconsequential that I, I really, I can't put her anywhere else. Non-character is the only thing I can describe this goddamn character as. 
Next up is Watchwarden Revion, who appears on screen for 9 minutes and 2 seconds. This character, much like at least two others, exists almost entirely to depict the fact that the various races of Middle-earth don't like each other very much, and I am intentionally using the word depict here instead of explore. The Watchwarden dislikes the Southlanders, so much so that he considers them to be inherently evil. He is also needlessly antagonistic and reckless when speaking to his captors, and is therefore not a pragmatist, and he is evidently willing to die for his values in circumstances where this was absolutely avoidable. It is, of course, rather difficult to believe that someone like this could ever hold a senior position of leadership within the elven military. He also seems entirely unaware that he got one of his own men killed needlessly, and like everything else in Rings of Power, he phases out of reality whenever he is off screen. Okay, Revion. Um, as much as I absolutely adored this actor's portrayal of Marcus Crassus in Spartacus, this character is just bad. Okay, next up is Treadwill, who appears on screen for 9 minutes and 23 seconds. Treadwill is the cow farmer with the sick cow at the start of the show, who joins up with the villagers from Tiharad and eventually fights and dies to try to save the Southlands. Treadwill is a very simple character and is completely forgettable, but on the scale of good to bad characters in Rings of Power, he actually does pretty well. He is a simple farmer who seems to be friendly with Waldrig, despite Waldrig being evil, and he's also able to hunt and is willing to fight to protect his home. He serves two purposes in the story, firstly to introduce the evil Kalgu plot element that takes Arendir and Bronwyn to Horden, and secondly to hammer home the tragedy of the Southlanders being tricked by the Orcs, as he is the only named Southlander to die as a result of this ploy. Alright, Treadwell buddy, Kalgu man, you're mostly functional. Nothing else to say here, the character is very simple, but I like him. I feel like I'd enjoy a drink with him. So, the, uh, Mystics, or Androgenites, I'm just gonna do all at once here, as, uh, they're all the same character, and they have the same goal. The only difference is their names and their appearance. The Nomad, the Ascetic, and the Dweller, names which I only know because I looked them up on IMDb in preparation for this video, appear for 10 minutes and 26 seconds, 10 minutes and 29 seconds, and 12 minutes and 31 seconds, respectively, 90% of which is in the final episode. To keep this nice and simple, I am going to skip over their various actions, because I have already covered them, and stick solely to what we know of them as characters, as people inhabiting Middle-earth. We know that they worship Sauron, that they are exceedingly incompetent, and that they take pleasure in arbitrarily destroying things, and that the Dweller, specifically, is an extremely powerful magic user. These three are barely characters. As a result, however, they aren't walking contradictions. They are simply extremely unintelligent plot devices. They exist solely to drive the tail end of the Harfoot plot, and they are then swiftly deleted. Okay, I'm putting all three of these in terrible. I'm not going to say that they break the show because they're just, they're too simple for that and they're too irrelevant to the rest of the plot. And because this is, of course, my own personal opinion, I am going to put them in terrible instead of bad because they're just hilariously transparent in terms of their purpose in the story. Okay, so Vilma has 11 minutes and 37 seconds of screen time. This is longer than Galadriel appeared for in The Lord of the Rings. In that time, Vilma doesn't actually do anything. She is essentially other Malva. Malva herself is, of course, an extremely thin character, but at least we know an amount of information about her. Vilma, on the other hand, could be deleted from the show and no one would notice. She just kind of follows Sadok around and stands there while other people talk. Is she his wife? Is she his concubine? I, I have- I don't know. So that I'm not accused of too much hyperbole, I am now going to tell you everything that Vilma does in Season 1 of Rings of Power. She repeats Sadok's reprimanding of Nori, saying, and she lied, which is acknowledged in the show as being a pointless thing to say because Sadok had literally just said exactly that. She informs Malva that people are getting hungry due to the fact that they are in a barren forest that they had expected would contain food, this interaction also being completely unnecessary as both we and Malva can clearly see that there is no food, telling Nori and co that if they go into the woods they may never come out alive, and telling Malva that Sadok is still with them in a spiritual sense. That is literally it. Eleven and a half minutes of screen time and that is all this character does. There is zero reason for this character to exist. She accomplishes nothing, and we know nothing about her. Vilma, you, you just, you're, you're not a character, I'm sorry. Up next is King Durin III, who appears for 11 minutes and 49 seconds. There was a point where King Durin was my favourite character in the show. He appears for just over 3 minutes total in episodes 2 and 4, and he was easily the best character at this point. After his 8 minutes of screen time in episode 7, however, he is now also in the dumpster alongside nearly everyone else. So, King Durin doesn't trust elves. We have absolutely no idea why. However, 
King Durin also does trust elves, at least enough to agree to help them build a forge. We also know that he is stubborn and ruthless and does not respond well to shouting matches. He respects his son even when he disagrees with him, is unfortunately an idiot who despite being incredibly cautious will walk into a dangerous mineshaft, does not understand the effectiveness of guarding something, and acknowledges the existence of gods and cares about what they think. Alright, it pains me because of how much I liked this character at the beginning, but King Durin, you're you're goddamn bad. Really, this character kind of exemplifies part of the problem with the writing of this show. The more time that the show spends with each of these characters, the more likely they are to be down here. The only, what, six characters that I've got here that are anything other than bad have appeared on screen for, what, 20 minutes total out of an eight-episode season. Okay, up next is Chancellor Farazan, who appears for 13 minutes. Farazan is in practice the secondary leader of Numenor behind Muriel, and apparently almost single-handedly dethroned her father and prevented him from dragging Numenor back to the old ways. Farazan is skilled at diplomacy and speechcraft, although this is not always shown to be 100% effective. And he is extremely influential, being either feared or respected by the citizens, or perhaps a combination of the two. Farazan respects his political opponents, but shows absolutely no respect for his son, which is a perspective which I absolutely support. He is also evidently terrible at identifying and acting on security risks to the royal line of Numenor. Okay, so Farazon to me kind of feels like a bargain bucket version of a Game of Thrones character, like think seasons one and two Varys and Littlefinger. This is the guy in the show who's doing the plotting and the scheming and he's trying to, you know, he's moving chess pieces around behind the scenes and you never really quite know what he's up to. Obviously, because it's Rings of Power, it's, it's a shadow compared with the earlier seasons of Game of Thrones. But that's, that's who this character is, essentially. And my guess is that when he starts actually doing things in future seasons, I assume, he's going to go way the hell down in my estimation. But for now, I think Farazan is pretty inoffensive as a character. Next up is Ontimo, Isildur's buddy who is on screen for 13 minutes and 27 seconds. Ontimo functions as comic relief man and seems to only exist to provide levity to the scenes he is in. Aside from his purpose, his character seems to be reasonably confident, he dislikes conflict and violence, he has a girlfriend or possibly a fiancé, and he is aspirational yet not particularly skilled with a sword. He is booted from the Sea Guard because of Isildur and doesn't seem to care, strangely, and he notably is the one single character who is killed off as a result of the volcano erupting. Okay, Ontimo, there's nothing to you, so I can't call you bad, I'm gonna say that you're inoffensive. Okay, next is easily one of the worst characters in the show, Malva, who appears for 14 minutes and 43 seconds. Malva, hilariously, has more screen time than Saruman, Treebeard, Elrond, or Eomer in The Lord of the Rings. Malva is incredibly frustrating because there is nothing morally good about her and yet the Harfoot society does not seem to notice or care. Malva is lazy, inconsiderate, oblivious to when she has done anything wrong, arrogant, ruthless in her application of punishment, has absolutely no qualms whatsoever about abandoning people to die and yet considers widowing or orphaning someone to be a bad thing suggests that Sadok leads Nori's quest to save Gandalf and then does not appear to be aware that Sadok is dead partly because of her own actions, she can't read, and she is apparently always right even though she is quite literally never right. She also seems to think that the point of living is to live good, which is just a hilarious contradiction given literally everything she does in the show. Alright, Malva is without a doubt a terrible character. She doesn't break the show because again her impact on the show is minimal. When you see who I put here, you'll hopefully understand why these characters are here. Next up is Gilgalad, who appears for 15 minutes and 26 seconds. Gilgalad is, in a word, useless. He is very perceptive and diplomatic, apparently has some limited ability to see the future, and he initially seems to be a somewhat believable elven leader. He is, however, also extremely superstitious for reasons that are entirely unexplained, seems to have absolute knowledge of things he can't possibly know, has insane plans that rely on blind luck, and is mildly displeased when presented with earth-shatteringly bad news. Okay, Gilgalad, I, I kind of feel like I should add an extra category for just dried up piss, because that's kind of how the impression that Gilgalad gives me. He's not terrible, he's definitely bad, but I feel like he should kind of be in between here. I just get this feeling whenever he's on screen, he's he just sort of speaks and nothing comes out. He's just there, he's just a wet sponge. 
Up next is Waldreg, who appears for 15 minutes and 31 seconds. Waldreg does not like elves at all, which is presumably as a result of his evil leanings. He is, however, civil when speaking to Arendir, even though he of course doesn't like him. He has a short temper, he dislikes Bronwyn being in charge, he believes Theo to be evil for absolutely no reason, and he is highly motivated to be evil, but is also extremely forgetful. Because of course he, uh, strangely forgets to bring the evil sword to Adar when he defects, even though this you one would think would be the one thing that he would want to do. So, uh, this aside, he would probably be inoffensive, but with this, he's- uh, Wildrag is absolutely a bad character. He's Evil McGee, who sits there twirling his mustache and forgets things so that the plot can happen. Okay, next is Valandil, whom I affectionately nicknamed Afrock, who appears for 19 minutes and 49 seconds. Valandil is easily top three characters in the show, but he is by no means anything approaching perfect. So, Valandil is flirtatious and confident, but also very competent. He seems to have a temper, even if for justifiable reasons, and believes that you need to earn what you get, and that hard work pays off. He therefore dislikes the fact that Isildur keeps getting a leg up due to him being from a family of status, suggesting that he is not. He is also dutiful and seems to be reasonably skilled with a sword. Now, the problems with Valandil. Firstly, he abandons his good friend Isildur and does not confirm that he is dead. Given that his duty is to Muriel, not Isildur, and given that Muriel has literally just been blinded, it may well be that he decided to leave Isildur in order to protect the Queen. This is definitely possible, and if true, informs us very clearly of his prioritization of duty over friendship. As we never get any dialogue to support this, however, this could simply be yet another instance of characters doing things to further the plot without actually acknowledging that they have done these things. The second issue I have with him is that he pressures Ontimo into joining the army, and then we have absolutely no recognition that this led to Ontimo being killed. A scene where he discusses with either Muriel or Isildur how he feels guilty, or perhaps doesn't, about what happened to Ontimo would have fleshed out both Valandil and Ontimo. But as this would not advance the plot, this of course means that the writers decided not to bother. Okay, in spite of his flaws, Afrock, buddy, you're going up there, mostly functional. He's probably my favorite character in the show. Okay, next is Deesa, who appears for 22 minutes and 25 seconds. Deesa is also one of the best characters in the show. She is outwardly very loyal to her husband, and also deeply respects him. There are, however, hints of a darker side, as we see Deesa manipulating Elrond very intentionally, almost threatening him at one point, speaking her mind about Durin's father multiple times even though he is her king. And at the end, we see that she is very eager to become a leader. She believes that the Mithril belongs to her and Durin, and no one else. Pretty much everything that Deesa does in the show is informed by what we know about her as a character rather than what the plot requires that she does, which makes a nice change. As a result, Deesa is the one character that I actually wanted to see more of in Season 1, and she is the only character that I look forward to seeing in Season 2. Okay, Deesa, you're going up here. You're mostly functional. I would say you're almost entirely functional. So, uh, yeah, we'll keep you up there for now. Best character in the show. So says I. Okay, next is Sadok, who appears for 24 minutes and one second, which is significantly longer than we spent with Faramir in The Lord of the Rings. Sadok is the highly superstitious leader of the Harfoots. He appropriately does not like outsiders, and he also does not like to be interrupted or disturbed. Okay, we're doing alright so far. Now then, Sadok also does not understand how cause and effect functions. He abandons his lifelong friends when they get old, hurt their ankle, get stuck in snow, try to save babies from natural disasters and or wolves, and he thinks dying to bees is hilarious. His wife, mother, or daughter was killed by wolves, this is unclear as he only names her as Daffodil Burrows, so it could be any of the above, and he doesn't seem to care that Nori and everyone else are still alive after abandoning them. He is essentially blind, he is extremely heavy, he is capable of teleportation, and he evidently wants to die. Sadok is a hilarious contradiction of a character. He is simultaneously the irritable and slightly wacky traditionalist old man, but he is also a being of pure goddamn evil. I don't know why people like this character, Sadok is terrible. He is a terrible person and no one seems to notice. Much like Malva, actually, come to think of it. Up next is Celebrimbor, who appears for 24 minutes and 4 seconds. Celebrimbor was a good character, but the longer we spent with him, the more chances the writers had to turn him into a moron. So, Celebrimbor is modest and aspirational, he dislikes war and wants to make the world a better place. He is extremely loyal to the High King, as he is willing to obey an order to deceive a friend, although reluctantly. He also has a deep admiration for the dwarves. He is also unfathomably naive, and despite being the greatest of elven smiths, is unaware of what an alloy is. Okay. This guy's supposed to be some kind of super genius, but it turns out that he just, he doesn't, he doesn't know jack shit. Calabrimbo, sorry, you're a bad character. Next up is Largo, Nori's father, who appears for 25 minutes and 15 seconds. Largo is very laid back and carefree, and views the world with wonder, and so is likely where Nori gets it from. 
He is the optimist in the family and is also willing to physically defend his daughter from danger even when he is injured. However, he is also extremely clumsy and prone to injuring himself for no good reason. He is unwilling to ask anyone for help when doing something that requires at least two people, is subsequently willing to slow down the entire half-foot migration by his intention of positioning himself at the front of the caravan, he does not notice when his children put themselves in very obvious danger, and he thinks Harfoots have hearts bigger than their feet despite repeatedly leaving people behind. Largo, very simple character, very very flawed, probably half of what he does just makes me go, how, how, can, you, how can you be that dumb? So yeah, he's a bad character. Next is the primary villain of the series, discounting Galadriel, of course, Adar, who appears for 25 minutes and 33 seconds. Adar cares deeply for the orcs and is motivated by wanting to give them a home. However, he also inflicts needless pain on the orcs, and the act of giving the orcs a home is apparently part of Sauron's master plan, suggesting that Adar is unknowingly doing Sauron's dirty work as he also claims to intensely dislike Sauron. He is highly motivated and doesn't seem to value his own life as he appears to be willing to die to achieve his goal. He also employs military strategy in such a way as to maximize drama in a TV show rather than to actually achieve what he wants to achieve. So the actor and what the character should be would easily put him up here in Mostly Functional. He, I, I really want to like him, but basically everything that he does in episode six means he definitely gets knocked down here to win offensive. Um, there is a good chunk of this character that is bad, even though I know that people who dislike the show typically think he's one of the best parts. I would contest that all four of these characters are better than Adar. Next up is Isildur, who appears for 27 minutes and 40 seconds. Isildur gets more screen time in Rings of Power than Boromir did in The Lord of the Rings. Isildur is one of the worst characters in the show. I think what the writers wanted to do was to have Isildur be a bit of a spoiled kid who doesn't know his place in the world, for him to then make up his mind and do the right thing. The problem is that at every single turn, Isildur is an entitled piece of shit who does not learn anything. So, Isildur claims to value his country and feels pressured to do what his father expects, and he's also a bit of a social outcast. These are the borderline positive traits that the show gives us to work with. The problem is, uh, well, it's everything else. Isildur is willing to spend however much time it takes to get a week off of becoming part of the Sea Guard and then quit with nine days to go. This suggests that he does not think ahead, he is reckless, and he instinctively pursues whatever it is that he wants at that exact moment. He previously got into a scrap with the Queen's Guard, indicating that he was potentially some kind of petty criminal. He was also thrown out of his horse training, although this was potentially not his fault. He repeatedly abuses his father's position to get what he wants, and frequently talks back to his father, and so is incredibly ungrateful. He is an entitled little brat who is indecisive to the point of absurdity, and in almost every instance appears to act without thinking. He desperately wants to go west, but we never have any indication as to why, beyond him considering it to be the real Numenor. Then, he desperately wants to join the army and thus do something that he considers to be worthy of Numenor, and we again never have any indication as to why. This entire character is driven by two separate and conflicting goals, neither of which are explained whatsoever, and why he decided to drop the first in favor of the second is a confounding mystery. The only line we get is that Isildur considers himself to have shamed the family name by getting kicked out of the Sea Guard, and that therefore he does not deserve to go west, even though, of course, the reason he got himself kicked out was so that he could go west. Okay, Isildur impacts the plot in a pretty substantial way, he also has a lot of screen time, and my guess is he's gonna have a lot more going forwards. This character breaks the goddamn show. All of his interactions with Kemen, all of his interactions with his father, this character seems to be the opposite of what the show wants him to be. So yeah, I'm putting him down here, I absolutely despise this character. Next is Marigold, who appears for 34 minutes and 45 seconds. Marigold is contrasted with her husband in that she is much more cautious and worrisome. She is a very stern mother who does not approve of Nori's carelessness. She gets very angry for very much justifiable reasons, and is very protective of both her children and Poppy. However, she also does not notice when her children put themselves in very obvious danger. By the end of season one, she has developed away from being a strict traditionalist mother into being one who is not only willing to allow her daughter to run off with a stranger, but one who actively encourages it. Okay, Marigold, I don't have a huge problem with. I definitely like her as a character more than Largo, because Largo's just a spaz. Marigold is not much to her, but what she does seems to be in line with what we know of her as a character. 
Next up is Prince Durin the Fourth, who appears for 36 minutes and 52 seconds. Durin only appears in three episodes, and he is usually the best part of those episodes. However, he is written by the writers of Rings of Power, which also means that he is terminally unintelligent. So, Durin is a brash, loud, and confident leader who comes off initially as very believable. He also feels personally responsible for the safety of his people. He is caring, extremely forgiving, very trusting to the point of coming off as incredibly gullible, acknowledges when he makes mistakes, and although he is stubborn, he is not too proud to admit when he is wrong. He can be emotionally fragile and likes to embellish stories so as to make himself look better, suggesting a degree of vanity. He also deeply respects his father, despite intensely disliking him. He is, however, extremely rude and disrespectful when on missions of apparent diplomacy, and makes extremely risky political moves for little to no reason. He is also, like virtually everyone else in the show, an idiot. Okay, so you may have seen that I put out some polls, uh, well, a month ago about a few characters. The first one was Durin, and you guys think he should be in B tier, which I will obviously lower because a B tier character in uh, Rings of Power is obviously not a B tier character in anything else. And just to look at some of the comments, I'll read a couple that I find particularly relevant. So Cyrus Smith says, I think no character in this show gets past B tier, at least for me, and that's because of the writing. If Durin was in a much better show, he would have been able to shine much more, but because he's in Rings of Power, any good characterization gets dampened by stupid actions that the script forces the characters to do. Uh, yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, Cy One says, B, he's probably the best character we have, and with an actor who can even display and transport emotions. On the other hand, he'd probably still call Elrond his best friend after having seen him stab his father and shag his mum. Yeah. Uh, that's the sad thing, is that Durin's one character flaw is that he is friends with Elrond. And I haven't got to Elrond yet, but Elrond, spoiler alert, I guess, Elrond breaks the show. Um, and everything Elrond is connected to suffers from that problem. And Durin is primarily connected, like, narratively to Elrond. If Elrond didn't exist and it was just Durin living his life in Khazad Doom, I might actually love to see that. Like, Durin and Disa in isolation are two of the best characters in the show, but they only ever do anything in relation to Elrond which obviously knocks them down a few pegs. Uh, Tyranno Moo says, in the context of the show, I'd give him an S+. I'm not sure I'd agree with that, but yeah, I can definitely understand why you'd say that. Okay, I am going to put Durin. I would put him in bad, because, th again, his relationship with Elrond just, it breaks the cat. I think I need to put him in bad, actually. Um, everything he does in the later half of the season knocks him down, I think, two tiers. He just does too much that makes absolutely no goddamn sense, and I just think he's unbelievable. In terms of acting, he's here. He is the best actor in the show, bar none. But, unfortunately, the character I do think is bad. Okay, next is Queen Regent Muriel, who appears for 38 minutes and 29 seconds. Muriel is a strong leader who is steadfast in her beliefs, is pragmatic, is willing to put herself in danger to save people, does not give up easily, and is willing to persevere no matter the cost. She also seems to be a more than competent hands-on leader. However, she also acts out of fear, she is not very perceptive, and thus she is easy to fool. And she also abandons people, although I can partly forgive this because she did so after having been blinded. Muriel... I, she's inoffensive. I don't have a huge problem with her. Um, I also don't mind the actress. She did a much, the actress did a much better job in Spartacus, but her portrayal of this character, I don't find particularly engaging. But yeah, there's, there are many characters in Rings of Power that are worse than Muriel. Okay, next up is The Stranger. Not Gandalf, definitely not Gandalf. Absolutely Gandalf. Whatever we want to call him. This character appears for 40 minutes and 10 seconds, and the problem with analyzing this character in any useful manner is that for about 38 of those 40 minutes, he is essentially brain damaged. This is basically the same problem as trying to say anything about King Tar Palantir, except that Gandalf appears for literally 10 times as long as the King of Numenor did. So The Stranger acts as if he's a child in a man's body, and any action he takes prior to his veil being apparently lifted in episode 8, does not actively inform us of his character in any meaningful way. All I can tell you about this character is that he wants to know where he came from, and that he seems to have decided that he is good because Nori told him that he is. So I really do not know where to put this character. He... I don't think he's a non-character because he does actually do things once he's, you know, lucid. He doesn't break the show. I don't think he's terrible. Um, I think we're gonna go with bad. I can't put him in inoffensive. I'm gonna put him in bad. He could go either way in season two. I genuinely don't know. For now, we're going with bad. Next up is Bronwyn's son, Theo, who appears on screen for 45 minutes and six seconds. Theo has an incredible amount of screen time for what amounts to a poorly acted and very simplistic character. 
Theo's arc is wholly that he dislikes Arendir and then learns to like Arendir. This is similar to the respective arcs of Legolas and Gimli in The Lord of the Rings, but Theo for some reason is on screen for 10 whole minutes longer than either Legolas or Gimli. Just think for a second how much we know about Legolas and Gimli, and now think about how little there is to Theo. Anyway, Theo initially dislikes elves, and also intensely dislikes mice, apparently. He is also evidently a thief, despite this never playing into his character beyond him stealing the evil sword. He also doesn't like being treated like a child, and he frequently wants to help by getting food or by fighting orcs. He also seems to be able to defend himself from orcs very effectively, which informs us greatly as to the danger that the orcs actually pose to the humans and Numenorians if they can't even kill a child. He also admires Galadriel, like nearly everyone else, and warms to Arendir after he saves him. Theo also seems to be sporadically clairvoyant, or it's possible that Arendir was, you know, sporadically deaf, as seems to occasionally be the case. Okay, Theo. I really don't like this character, and uh, I don't know if you remember when I was taking notes on the show, I didn't actually start taking notes on this character until, I think, episode four, when he uh, goes into back to Tiharad to get food, and then gets rescued by Arendir, because until then, he was just a nothing of a character. He was the son that wants to be the hero, but he can't because he's just a little boy. Theo I thought was terrible, and if you remove him entirely, then, I mean, the show's just better. Okay, up next is Elendil, who appears for 45 minutes and 13 seconds. Elendil is calm, measured, diplomatic, confident, and is not easily intimidated. He thinks superstition is unwise, he learns from his mistakes, and he is a stern father. He believes his daughter Iarian to be gifted, motivated, and talented, believes his son Isildur to be careless and impulsive, and also has a third child called Anarion, who is not seen and is mentioned once, indicating that Elendil dislikes him and possibly disowned him. He repeatedly steps in to give Isildur a leg up, possibly informed by the fact that he deferred twice on his own sea trial and he wants Isildur to do better than he did. He also cares very much about Isildur's safety, but he also does not care about Isildur's safety. He seems to struggle when disciplining his children, indicating that he is a less than capable father who was possibly forced into the dad role after his wife died. He also seems to believe that being at sea is good for the soul and can heal even the deepest of wounds, possibly indicating that he takes the sea is always right extremely seriously and very literally. He also does what the sea tells him, even if this is an act of treason, is not particularly perceptive, shirks his responsibilities, is extremely gullible and easy to fool, and believes the sea to always be right, even though the sea presumably killed his wife. Okay, so what did you guys have to say about Elendil? Um, you put him in C tier, which I did mix this up a little bit, which I probably shouldn't have. C tier means you think he's worse than Durin, and I would definitely agree. But quite a few of you also think that he's, uh, you know, D or E tier, so let's see what you said. Okay, this is a very good comment here from Reeve1991. So, uh, he says, I feel I'm just being charitable enough to put Elendil in C tier. He kind of scrapes his way into it, but I do feel he's a cut above the D tier mess. This mostly comes down to the actor and the way he sells dealing with difficult situations, primarily Galadriel and Isildur. At least I think I have a decent grasp on his intended character as a steadfast and honorable man who wants the best for Numenor and is willing to buck social conventions or risk personal harm for what he thinks is right. His actor really does the most he can with really weak material. I completely agree there. He's one of the best actors in the show. While he's not way too good for this show, he at least puts in respectable effort. He adds real emotional weight to his scene with Isildur where he refuses to pull straight to get his idiot son on the military expedition, showing his character's sense of honor and his genuine attempts at parenting Isildur to get him to be less of a shitbag. Every scene he has with Galadriel kind of ends up being unintentionally hilarious. He plays it so measured, so calm and self-assured, they all come across like a parent dealing with a bratty child. Yeah, gotta agree with that. Which is more than a little ridiculous given that he's a mortal man and Galadriel is, I believe, the oldest living thing on Middle Earth that isn't an end or seared and the shipwright. Um, I don't know who seared and the shipwright is, uh, given that I think yeah, no, Galadriel has parents, so she isn't the oldest living thing on Middle-earth. Uh, whether she is in, in the source material, again, I don't know, but in the show, uh, we hear that mother and father are waiting, so she has parents, she can't be the oldest thing on Middle-earth. Honestly, Elendil could, be, could maybe have shot up to B tier if he maintained this throughout the show, but unfortunately his character takes a pretty hard nosedive after the ships leave Numenor. It's outright bizarre how little reaction they allow him to have to the apparent death of his own son, and that instead it's his queen being blinded that sends him into a sudden emotional breakdown and regretting his past advocacy for Galadriel. His she drowned scene is so poorly and bizarrely written and filmed that it's incredible to me that nobody picked up how unintentionally hilarious it is. I have absolutely no idea why that scene is even there. It doesn't flesh out the character, it just raises hilarious questions. 
There's also a grey area with Elendil where there's a lot that I legitimately don't know if it's meant to be nuanced or conflicting character elements or just shitty writing. For instance, him claiming that he's obligated to bring Galadriel to Numenor, but later it's quite clear that everyone is upset with his choice, and the Queen outright says his decision could be considered treason. Yeah, this was just goddamn confusing, and I don't think the writers read their own script. I legitimately have no idea if he saved Galadriel simply because he felt it was the right thing to do, knowing it would get him in trouble, and out of either professionalism or humility, lied to Galadriel about why he was saving her, or if the writers completely forgot about him saying he was obligated to return Galadriel to Numenor before the following scenes. Um, so my take on that was that he presumably had generic orders to return anyone that he finds at sea to Numenor, meaning like Numenorians, you know, people who have been lost at sea or anyone else. Like, I guess if he'd found Halbrand there, then he would bring him back. Um, of course, not knowing that Halbrand is Sauron. Uh, bringing an elf to Numenor is evidently treason, so I have to assume that he knows that he wasn't supposed to do that, but he did it anyway, because of course his name means that he loves elves. Anyway, similarly, I have no idea if the writers completely forgot about the obvious conflict of having a loved one drown with all the past scenes of that mind-numbing mantra, the sea is always right, or if it was intended that Elendil was deeply conflicted and aggrieved over his nation's traditions, and culture effectively saying that his wife deserved to die, and this was incredibly poorly conveyed. Yeah, again, all of that was just, I don't know why that was there, the whole his wife died thing. Either way, I think we have a general idea of the intended shape of his character. I enjoyed his presence in a decent number of scenes, so for, I'm happy to let him reside in Cita. Excellent comment, and thank you for that, uh, Reeve1991. I would agree that initially I enjoy Elendil. I think in episode three, when he's first introduced, he's definitely one of the highlights of the show. Um, but his whole, everything from like season five onwards, he just falls down into dumpster tier for me. Uh, the Thai buddy says, C tier, the C is always right. Excellent. Okay, so with all that fresh in my mind... I want to put him in inoffensive because I do enjoy, or I did enjoy the character and I do like the actor. Gotta put him in bad though. Uh, his relationship with Isildur breaks. He He's a goddamn gullible moron who keeps trying to help his idiot son even though he doesn't particularly want to help his idiot son. And I can't take him seriously. Okay, next up is Poppy, who appears for 47 minutes and 32 seconds. I don't really have much to say about Poppy except that she is bargain bucket Samwise Gamgee. Poppy is clumsy, she is extremely food oriented, and she's inexplicably unskilled at eating. She cares about Nori as if she is her younger sister. She is relatively sensible and cautious. She seems to exist purely to look out for Nori, but also begrudgingly willing to help Nori break the rules. She views Nori's family as her own surrogate family as she lost her parents and three siblings in a landslide. Poppy embodies what I think the writers wanted the Harfoots to be. Unfortunately for them, Sadok is the embodiment of what the Harfoots actually are. And then at the end of the season, she for some reason chooses to stay with the other Harfoots rather than go on an adventure with Nori and Gandalf, and I have absolutely no idea why. Okay, Poppy... I think is firmly in the inoffensive category. She is very obviously a side character who just plays second fiddle to Nori the entire time. She doesn't do anything of her own accord, really. She doesn't have any agency, but again, there's no real problems with her. Um, I don't know if I want this character to be in season two, if they're just like, actually, yeah, she did go with uh, Nori and Gandalf. Uh, I don't think that will happen, but I guess maybe the writers decided that given that Nori is going to go on an adventure with Gandalf, Poppy doesn't need to be there because Nori now has someone else that she can bounce dialogue off and they can tell each other things that they already know so that the audience understands what's going on. So yeah, Poppy I think is mostly inoffensive. Okay, up next is Bronwyn, who appears for 49 minutes and 24 seconds. Bronwyn is extremely physically strong, despite being a small and unimposing woman. She is very brave and is willing to endanger herself to rescue her son. However, she also prioritizes frolicking off on adventures with Arendir over protecting her son. Thankfully, the tunnely boy didn't arrive until she was back. Anyway, she's also direct in her speech, is apparently charismatic and compelling, even though this is not really conveyed, and can convince people who don't know her to fight and die alongside her. She also yells at enemies while attacking them quietly, can regenerate health faster than Master Chief, and of course, she knows all about holes. Okay, Bronwyn, I'm not gonna say is terrible, I'm definitely gonna say is bad. Uh, she is one-dimensional as hell, but she's pretty consistently one-dimensional. Okay, next up is Halbrand slash Sauron, who appears for one hour and four minutes and 39 seconds. When tallying up the total screen times from Rings of Power and The Lord of the Rings, Halbrand slash Sauron places 10th. This character is fundamentally flawed, as I delved into in my coverage of episode 8, but prior to the grand reveal of the absolutely retarded master plan that requires him to be both hellbent on world domination, but also wanting to live a quiet life as a blacksmith, he was a reasonably entertaining character. 
So, excluding the bits that were revealed as very obvious lies, Sauron is perceptive and intuitive, doesn't take bullshit, and does not mince words. He knows how to respect royalty, prefers to be diplomatic rather than threatening people, is provocative and overconfident, and also willing to break the law. He seems to avoid violence where possible, but is extremely violent when pushed into a fight. He has incredibly convoluted plans that do not make any sense, he can incapacitate people indefinitely by simply thinking it, he is unwilling to kill Galadriel despite her potentially standing in the way of his mission, and he prioritizes fucking with people over taking over the world. So Sauron's identity and plan are the big reveal at the end of season one. The biggest mystery in the show, and the driving force of the narrative, is Galadriel's quest to locate and defeat Sauron. As with most characters, however, Sauron is not some master manipulator whose grand plan makes all the pieces fall into place in a way that is coherent and in character. Sauron is instead a petty idiot with inconsistent and mutually exclusive goals. So much as I enjoyed the actor's portrayal of this character, I think he breaks the show. Sauron and his plan is pretty much the backbone of the season, and if you watch the season from start to finish, which I, 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 you know, I did that so you guys obviously don't have to, whilst aware that of what Sauron's goal is, very few of his actions actually make any sense. So yeah, he breaks the show because he only does what he does so that the plot can happen and so that the writers can attempt to keep his identity a mystery. Okay, up next is Arendir, with one hour and five minutes and 39 seconds of screen time, the ninth highest across the series and movies. Arendir is a mixed bag. He absolutely had potential, and I honestly really wanted to like this character. Unfortunately, this simply was not possible. So, Arendir has godlike cognitive ability and has extremely good hearing. However, he also does not have extremely good hearing. He is also extremely strong and agile, but is also not extremely strong or agile. He is also capable of insane feats of hand-eye coordination. Arendir is not quick to anger, avoids violence where possible, and is pragmatic in that he will do things he doesn't want to if it will avoid violence. He prioritizes love over duty, but also prioritizes exploring a hole over protecting Bronwyn. He is also very protective of Theo, even though Theo doesn't like him, is terrible at keeping secrets, is terrible at hiding things, and is ultimately an idiot. Right, so you guys think that Arendir is... Well, middle to bottom. Let's see what you said. Okay, well, here we go. Reeve1991 again with the, uh, you, you're doing half of my video for me, buddy. Thank you. I'd go with D-tier that very occasionally threatens to break into C-tier, but never quite does. While Arendir isn't as egregiously offensive as many of the other characters, there's also strikingly little to him, despite the inordinate amount of screen time he receives. Despite spending so many hours with him, I don't really know what you could conclusively say about his character, other than he's superhumanly badass and he loves Bronwyn, neither of which I would consider to be actual character traits. Yeah, that's pretty much it. There's not really anything else to him. Um, most of what I described falls under both of these categories. Him being superhumanly badass seems to exist entirely independently of his character, an aspect that he has because he's a main character and the showrunners want to do cool fight scenes with him like Legolas. It doesn't actually inform his character by making him smug or cocky or anything else. Indeed, him having that trait with the series makes his character less coherent, not more, because we're given absolutely no reason as to why he's an order of magnitude more badass than the other elven soldiers in his garrison unit. This is absolutely true, because um, again, in Lord of the Rings, you are, the only time you see elves do any fighting is in the prologue, uh, which is not in the same context at all to every time you see Legolas doing any fighting. So every time you see Legolas doing what he does, we are comparing it with the other characters in the Fellowship. Whereas everything that uh, Arendir is doing is frequently alongside other elves who, they're, you know, they're just not as good as him because, you know, they're not the main character. Okay, he loves Bronwyn, feels more like a Dekel than a character trait. Dekel? Dekel? I never know how to pronounce that. It already exists in the story before we enter it and remains completely static at every single point throughout the story. Every single way this could be, could have been used to reveal character and create dynamics is almost aggressively avoided. We never come to understand why they're together, which is something that really demands explanation in a universe where such pairings are so unbelievably staggeringly rare that every single one is the subject of myth and legend, and that's not even bringing in the book law, as this is mentioned by the show in a throwaway line. We never come to understand what they like about each other. Hell, I don't even think he and Bronwyn have ever had a single conversation that isn't functionally expository in nature. You know that I don't like Arendir and I don't like Bronwyn, but I do quite like the scene that they have um, immediately before the, the battle in episode 6. That scene was not expository, however it is the only one, I think, that is not expository. We don't know why they like each other, we just know that they kind of already do by their second scene, because uh, he shows up at her house and she's like, uh, he, he says, like, I've got to go away, and then she's like, oh, tell, say what you want to say, tell me you love me, and we're going to run off and be happy or something. So by that point, the, the romantic entanglement has already happened, it's just established as, you know, it just is. 
uh, we never really understand why it is. Anyway, I don't even need to pile on the stuff that was clearly unintended, like the absurd manner of the way he gets captured near the beginning, or his utterly absurd battle plans for episode 6 being evidence that he's an idiot, because that's clearly completely unintended collateral from the writers being lazy, stupid hacks. 100% agreed. We get the slightest glimmer of character potential in his scene with Theo prior to the battle, where he takes some time to pass on some element of his skill set to give Theo confidence while starting, just starting to explain his actual feelings and character motivations, and then the scene's done, moving on, never coming back to that. Yeah, again, I quite liked that scene. I think that it existed more for Theo than for Arendir, because it informed us a little bit more of Theo's progression to, you know, accepting Arendir as this, like, father-type figure, because of course we know nothing about Arendir's, about Theo's father, and of course Theo was established to not like elves, meaning that this, as, as simplistic as it is, it is character building for Theo. So by the end of the show, despite the many, many hours of screen time he's had, Arendir ends up as he began and shall remain, a stiff, stoic brick whose motivations can't be understood beyond the most superficial, who experiences no actual character conflict whatsoever, and we're never allowed a glimpse into what's really going on beneath that bland, dour professionalism. He's an ascended side character, the sort that in normal stories run adjacent to our protagonists in supportive roles and can afford to be completely static and two-dimensional with no traits beyond is a badass fighter and loves his girlfriend, but somehow is presented as the focus of our storyline and without a single unique compelling element to him, that's D tier to me. Uh, I completely agree with all of this. Whether I will put him in D tier, I am undecided yet. Andrew Walt says, you can tell he's a thousand years old because he's apparently used up all his facial expressions. Yeah, the, the only scene where he actually makes facial expressions is when he's getting, is when he's doing his boss battle with the giant orc. I'm not going to read that username. If he wasn't a thousand years old and getting battle strategy from a vegan medicine woman, I'd put him at B. If they made use of him, I think he could be good. Uh, yeah, fair comment. Okay, Aaron Deer. I don't think he's terrible. I don't think he's on the same tier as the rest of these. I think he's going to go in bad. Um, I want him to be inoffensive, but God damn it, the character is just too inconsistent for me to put him any higher than this. Okay, next is Nori, who appears on screen for one hour and eight minutes and 39 seconds, placing seventh overall and beating Pippin from The Lord of the Rings. This may surprise most of you, but I think if I set aside my personal opinion, Nori is one of the best characters in the show. This is almost entirely because there is so little to her, but there is not really anything to contradict. I can't rate her too highly on the tier list personally, though, because I find her just so goddamn boring. Anyway, Nori is, as we are told about six times in the first episode, brave, curious, clumsy, and doesn't follow the rules. She feels responsible for people, which seems to be perceived as a character flaw. She is, strangely, willing to blackmail her friend in order to get what she wants, but is also willing to cover up the fact that her friend has helped her in order to avoid getting that friend into trouble. She does not consider herself to be special, but is willing to physically defend herself if needed. She is also naive, she doesn't appear to understand how ice works, and she doesn't seem to care that she was abandoned by the other Harfords. She is also an idiot. She is willing to risk her life to protect Gandalf. She is willing to put everyone's lives at risk when it suits her. She is unobservant and is also incredibly lucky. So Nori is a walking contradiction. It makes a degree of sense having Bilbo and later Frodo be enthralled by the world beyond the Shire. The hobbits in The Lord of the Rings live in an untouched corner of the world, and as they are small and imposing people who typically enjoy things like gardening and going to the pub as a fantasy representation of life in the pre-industrial English countryside, and to some degree Tolkien's own reflection of himself. He stated in a letter, quote, I am in fact a hobbit in all but size. I like gardens, trees, and unmechanized farmlands. I smoke a pipe, and I like good plain food, unrefrigerated. But I detest French cooking. I like, and even dare to wear in these dull days, ornamental waistcoats. I am fond of mushrooms out of a field, and I have a very simple sense of humor which even my appreciative critics find tiresome. I go to bed late and get up late when possible. I do not travel much. The Harfoots, conversely, migrate constantly. They do not live quiet lives away from the larger problems of the world because of the inherent nature of their lifestyle. Writing them to have societal rules along the lines of don't go off trail in order to allow Nori to break these rules is simply unbelievable and nonsensical. I can absolutely believe that a hobbit from the Shire might long for an adventure and therefore be considered strange or an outcast by his society. I cannot believe for a moment that a constantly migrating Harfoot might do the same. Okay, Nori. So you guys really don't like Nori. I feel like this may be a little bit harsh, but let's see what you have to say. Okay, Zerkalda Zer says, Nori is a C-level character for me. She doesn't involve or change as a character, but she wasn't irritating or offensive on her own. My annoyance comes more from how the narrative uses her, both yo-yoing her relationship with Gandalf or how one note she is, but even bare bones, she at least doesn't break her character. Yeah, I agree with this. Uh, she's not particularly irritating because she's just so simple. 
Okay, Charles Urban says, I could have picked B for brave or C for clumsy, but I settled on D if it doesn't follow the rules. At least she's annoying only in a benign sense, unlike the amoral Elrond or the psychopathic genocide engine that is Galadriel. Yeah, this is the thing. If Nori is a bad character, let's just say that she is a bad character, it doesn't really mean much. It doesn't amount to anything because it doesn't interact with anything else in the greater world. So the consequences of her being a terrible character or a terrible person are basically nil. Uh, Captain Hurricane says she's one of the few likable characters in the show, but her desire to be different from the others makes no sense in a society that needs to stick together to survive. Her reasons for leaving her kin behind and heading off with Hobo Candalf make no sense either. I give her a C. Yeah, I feel like this is a fair comment. I don't understand fully why she desperately wants to get away and out and, you know, see the wider world or whatever, because she's, you know, she's been doing that for her entire life. Except that, of course, the Harfoot Society has the, uh, rules, the very blunt rules. Nobody goes off trail thus allowing her to then break those rules, which sounds like it should make sense, but of course doesn't. Uh, Joseph Nebotrius says, Difficult. It was an unnecessary character, I would say C or D. It was not unnecessarily irritant or offensive, but it was as deep as a bucket and not least as evil as the other hobos. Uh, character motivations are at least odd. Wanting to explore and being curious when you're a nomad is strange, unless the motivation is leaving Sadok's evil hobo cult. Uh, yeah, completely agree with that. But again, we th this is another fundamental problem with the goddamn Harfoots is none of them are aware that what they're doing is so reprehensible. Like, if Nori was like, these people are goddamn savages, I need to fucking leave, then I would absolutely be behind this character. Come on, yeah, you go, girl, you leave. You you need to leave right now. I don't care how dangerous it is. You take Poppy, take got the bloody Dilly with you, and go and live in the woods. Stop migrating and just live in the woods, and, you know, you got Gandalf, so you'll be all right. You'll save yourself from some wolves. At least you won't be complicit in, well, potentially mass murder. Like, what happens if all of them get snowed in and Sadok's the only one left? Does he just like, right, it's time to migrate, bye. I don't, I don't fucking know. Uh, Black Diamond says, given that the entire Hobbit plot could be cut from the show and absolutely nothing would be lost, that alone is to make her a bottom tier character. Sorry, but being pointless in a show doesn't mean she gets excused just because she isn't the most annoying. Even then, I dump her in the annoying pool. She doesn't do anything productive outside of helping Gandalf, and even that she does poorly and at the expense of everyone around her. She has no readily defined set of skills, no real motivation for helping Gandalf beside the obnoxious do-gooder attitude, and yet is bullheaded enough to keep doing what she wants even when she's been outed for it. They made Galadriel seem smart by making everyone around her into idiots. They made Nori morally good, and I use the term loosely, by making the other hobbits into evil gremlins. Yeah, I think you're absolutely on point there. She doesn't really have any reasons for doing what she does. She's very one note. Uh, even though she isn't contradictory, she's, she's, I mean, you're right. She's pretty pointless. Okay, Nori, I'm going to put in bad. I don't think she's terrible. She definitely doesn't break the show because the impact that she has on the show is minimal. Uh, but there is enough bad about her to, me, uh, to qualify me putting her here instead of inoffensive. I think her biggest crime is that she is goddamn boring. Okay, in second place in terms of screen time is Elrond with 1 hour and 19 minutes and 58 seconds, placing sixth overall just behind Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. Elrond is an intensely frustrating and fundamentally broken character. Every scene in which he appears seems to disregard every scene that came before it. Neither he nor any of the characters he interacts with ever seem to be aware of his previous actions. So Elrond is creative, likes time to himself, is lighthearted and relaxed. He is also well-versed in history, is very confident in his diplomatic skills, and is somewhat confident in his physical ability. He is perceptive and persistent, but also prone to giving up, is willing to call out when he is being lied to, and values his friendship over his duty to the High King. Elrond considers staying true to one's word to be of the highest value, but also values his oath so much that he accidentally breaks it repeatedly without realizing. Elrond is a dick. Elrond is manipulable and ignorant. He is terrible at timekeeping. He is bad at reading social cues. He is willing to spy on his friend. He is an idiot who can't keep his mouth shut. He is a terrible friend. He is a moron. He is honest whilst also being dishonest. He is willing to emotionally blackmail his friends. He is forgetful and unobservant. He is a dishonorable and manipulative liar. And he is willing to admit to his mistakes even if they aren't actually his mistakes. Okay, what did you guys say about Elrond? Pretty even split between C, D, and E. Let's see what the comments say, because I, I think I know where I'm putting him. Okay, Big Red says E, only because there's nothing below it. Absolutely awful interpretation of the character. Totally agree. Uh, Matt Hunter says G for gay. Uh, I mean, maybe. We uh, cannot confirm, allegedly. Pavel Bellic says E for inconsistency. I see what you did there. Well done. Uh, Edward Wilkes says E for egregious. Yeah, you guys obviously do not like him. Um, I will be placing him in my equivalent E tier. I think that Elrond breaks the show. Um, as with Sauron and Isildur, every action he takes 
only facilitates the plot. It does not make any sense if you are supposed to take him as a, as a character or as any semblance of some kind of real person. No character ever seems to react to him as one might react to a person who behaves as he does, which critically causes problems with, like, Durin specifically, because as I said, Durin would be at least one or two tiers higher if not for this goddamn character. Right, anyway, that leaves us with one more to go. Now we come to the big cheese, the character with by far the most screen time in Rings of Power and the most important character that the writers needed to get right. Galadriel has a whopping two hours and 17 minutes of screen time, nearly a full hour more than anyone else. She falls three minutes short of Frodo in The Lord of the Rings, meaning that with that one slim exception, Galadriel in Rings of Power has substantially more screen time than any character in either this show or in The Lord of the Rings trilogy. Let's start with the bits that had potential. Galadriel seems willing to bow to authority if needed, even if begrudgingly. She is apparently severely traumatized and can be sympathetic towards others' losses, really enjoys riding horses, believes for some reason that her bloodline needs redeeming, and seems to be able to appeal to the desires of the people she speaks to after getting a lesson in how to speak like an actual person older than the age of six from Sauron. Now then, what are Galadriel's skills? Galadriel is extremely talented at origami, climbing, using a sword, she has godlike powers of deduction. She can 1v1 a troll. She is the commander of the Northern Armies, the warrior of the Wastelands, and the scourge of the Orcs. She considers fighting to be her only purpose in life. She is not interested in socializing with others. She is unable to negotiate her way out of disagreements. She is violent and impulsive as a child, and remains so as an adult. She is highly motivated to the point of obsession. She has absolute disregard for her own life and the lives of her companions. She is willing to threaten murder to get what she wants, and is willing to manipulate people to get what she wants whilst simultaneously apologizing to them for manipulating them previously. Galadriel only cares about what she herself wants. She claims to value humility, yet appears to be vain. She dislikes pridefulness, but is extremely defensive of elves. Galadriel is incredibly rude and entitled, is sarcastic, is not modest, does not care whatsoever if she makes people angry, is cocksure, is an idiot as she does not understand why a blacksmith might be skilled at handling swords, is demeaning and is arrogant. She is incredibly selfish, is quite literally invincible, and is also omniscient. She cannot control her emotions. She is morally okay with genocide. She is willing to torture someone to get what she wants, and she is willing to go out of her way to torture someone for no reason. Possibly most importantly, she also appears to prioritize her own self-preservation over the safety of the entirety of Middle-earth. Okay, what did you guys say about Galadriel? I'm gonna take a guess here and say that you did not like her. Here we go. That is, that is, that is fantastic. E for everyone. 85% of you think she's E tier. Let's see. So Clem Diamond says, E, Galadriel embodies everything wrong with Rings of Power. Her story is only contrivance after contrivance. The dialogue is abysmal. She is thoroughly unlikable because she's an idiot, angry, know-it-all brat, but she's perfect in every way. She treats everyone poorly, considers humiliating four or five young soldiers as a lesson, but even her technique was dumb. And of course she is invincible. I feel nothing for a character that survives the blast of Volcano just because it looked cool. They should all be dead, if not earlier, then definitely from this. Finally, I do not know how good the actress is. Maybe she is and has a true range of emotions, but not in this production. She has the smug look of I'm the invincible, always right main character. I'm better than you in every way. Yeah, let's just say that I grew sick of looking at her face. Um, gotta agree with you there. In maybe 10 minutes of screen time, Elijah from Lord of the Rings have more range, even from elven, otherworldly, grace to menace, ambition, fear, and joy. Yep, completely agree with that. Kate Blanchett's performance in Lord of the Rings just hints at a backstory, whereas Morphid Clark in Rings of Power just she's exactly what it says on the tin as shallow as a puddle. Rings of Power Galadriel's only joy was riding a horse. Yeah I think this is the only time she smiled apart from when she meets Elrond right at the beginning but that's in lasts about five seconds. You cannot tell me she is overwhelmed with guilt and vengeance must let must less that she'll literally kill every innocent in Numenor and then she's like yay horse. Yeah gotta agree with that. That's a good comment. Thank you for that. Um, other comments we got here, I was charitable and gave it a D, E for exasperating, where is Z tier? You're missing the T rating for Tempest, yeah. Uh, Fer Blancart says she is a perfectly written unbearable character that bends reality around her giving everyone infinite patience and incompetence. Yeah, the uh, world of the show manifests itself in such a way as to make Galadriel seem like a good person when she, of course, is not. Right, time to rate Galadriel. So, I am gonna put her in terrible. I don't think she breaks the show, at least not compared with these three. I think these three are worse characters than Galadriel. The reason why Galadriel is so frustrating to so many people is that the show treats her and presents her as being something that she definitely is not. She's not necessarily contradictory, like in her own actions and behavior, but her actions and behavior are at odds with what the show keeps trying to force down your throat as telling you what she is. 
So yeah, that's the tier list. Uh, the best characters in the show, or my favorites at least, are... What's this guy's name again? Uh, Finrod. I nearly forgot his name again. Uh, Treadwell, the Kalgu Man, Afrok, Valandil, and Disa. And the worst, because I don't even count these four as characters. They're excluded. Uh, the worst are Isildur, Sauron, and Elrond. Uh, the only reason why Sauron is there is because of the whole twist reveal master plan bullshit. If you just took Halbrand as Halbrand and eject everything that's in episode 8, he would bump up a couple of tiers at least. But with the season as a whole, he absolutely breaks the show. Okay, so those were the characters in Rings of Power. I have mentioned some comparisons to the screen time in The Lord of the Rings, so I'm now going to just present those graphs to you to sink your eyes into. Okay, so this right here is the various screen times of the uh, characters in Rings of Power uh, split up by their episodes, so you can see the different colors relating to the different episodes. I've highlighted in green the uh, episodes in which the characters have most of their screen time, and black is uh, episodes that they do not appear in. Um, you can see how much more screen time Galadriel has than anyone else, and then you've got Elrond, Nori Arendir, uh, Sauron, and then you start getting into the more secondary characters down here. So yeah, pause this if you want to have a deeper look, but uh, this was part of my research and I thought I should probably present it to you because some of you might find it interesting. And then what I did is I also found uh, screen times for the various characters in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, split by movie. Again, you can see Frodo has a massive amount more screen time than anyone else. Then you've got Aragorn and Sam, then Gandalf, then Pippin, then Merry, and then you're getting into the secondary characters. Uh, Eowyn, Boromir, Theoden, Faramir all have less than half an hour of screen time. And if you compare that to Rings of Power, it's just goddamn hilarious is what it is. I can't even, I can't even, guys. So um, next, what I thought I would do is I copied the Rings of Power screen times onto the Lord of the Rings screen times. And uh, this is every character in either the films or the series that has more than 30 minutes of screen time. So at the top, we have Frodo followed very closely by Galadriel and Rings of Power. And uh, think for a moment about how much we know about these two characters. Uh, then you have Aragorn and Sam, who have a lot more screen time than anyone else. Gandalf and Elrond from Rings of Power have virtually the same amount of screen time. I was surprised that Gandalf's screen time would th was this low, but then I guess he isn't in most of the two towers. So that's probably why it's so low. Nori, Arendir, Halbrand, and Pippin, obviously from Lord of the Rings, all have virtually the same amount of screen time. And again, just think how much we know about Pippin, how endearing of a character he is. Compare that to Nori. Like, I mean, Jesus Christ. Uh, Merry is kind of there on his own at 55 minutes. And then you have Bronwyn, Poppy, Elendil, Theo, and the Stranger, all with between 40 and 50 minutes, which is more than Gollum, Legolas, and Gimli, uh, which is just goddamn hilarious. Then you have Muriel, Prince Durin, and Marigold, who all have more than Boromir, Eowyn, and Theoden, which really is rather depressing, is it not? Now then, I am going to move on to the plot of Rings of Power. In order to properly understand why stories like Rings of Power are fundamentally bad, I need to explain how cause and effect function. This may sound like I'm stating the obvious, but apparently a substantial number of people either don't understand this, or don't notice, or don't care. So bear with me. I consider virtually any breach in cause and effect to be detrimental to a script. There are very specific reasons why a writer may choose to deliberately breach cause and effect for the purpose of satire or social commentary or just for laughs, but when this happens, it is very much intentional. To make this point, I am going to reference a scene from the 1997 cinematic masterpiece George of the Jungle. I am the richest, smartest, handsomest guy here, so I have to go first! Bad guy falls in poop. Classic element of physical comedy. Now comes the part where we throw our heads back and laugh. So the dastardly Lyle Vandergroot trips on a branch and falls in poop. Pretty simple, right? What moving parts were needed? Lyle Vandergroot, the branch, and the poop, right? Wrong. It has to make sense that Lyle could trip over this branch. If Lyle were meticulously considering every step, this scene would not make sense. However, as he is stressed out and is not being careful, it is understandable and even probable that he could fall over in this scenario. The branch is also important. Lyle has to trip over something, and that something has to be something that could reasonably exist in this location. If Lyle tripped over an icicle, this would not make sense. In an absurdist comedy like George of the Jungle, it is entirely possible that they could pull a joke out of Lyle tripping over something that had no reason to be there, but this would mean that the joke is the break in continuity. It is funny because it doesn't make sense. And finally, the poop. 
The poop has to come from somewhere, and whilst George of the Jungle is not specific as to what animal this poop came from, it is reasonable that there is poop in the middle of the jungle. If this scene were taking place in New York, it would not work. In California, it might. Another example from the film where cause and effect are explicitly breached is when Ndugo is thrown off a very high bridge and into a canyon. And he is then saved, quite literally, because the narrator says so. Don't worry, nobody dies in this story. They just get really big boo-boos. What did I tell you? The comedy here comes from the fact that this does not make any goddamn sense whatsoever. I'm all for death of the author, but you quite simply cannot do a scene like this by accident. The writer's intention here was to manipulate time and space in an absurd manner in order to make the audience laugh. They are deliberately doing something that does not make sense. Doing this in something like The Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones would be an incredibly detrimental thing to do. So, all of that may have sounded like I was stating the obvious, but I wanted to firmly establish how a simple chain of causation only functions if the individual elements make sense. In order to show as concisely as possible why the writing in Rings of Power is simply non-functional, I have prepared a flowchart which I will go through in a moment. Before I do, I have divided the various criticisms I have of the plotting into five categories of varying severity. I have not taken these categories from a book or anything, I've simply defined them myself to be as useful as I think is possible. There is naturally quite a degree of overlap between these categories, but I have tried to remain as consistent as I can. It is also worth noting that one single scene, which is heavily contrived, does not make a movie or show bad. It makes it less than perfect, but as we know, nothing is perfect. As we are about to discover, or as you will already know if you have watched my previous videos, the reason why Rings of Power is bad is because of the frequency and severity of these plot errors. The first of these writing problems is character errors, which include instances of individual characters discovering things via logical fallacies, such as Galadriel discovering Halbrand's lineage, acting against their established desires, such as Durin giving Elrond a piece of mithril, or doing things that, broadly speaking, do not make sense and are therefore unbelievable, such as Galadriel jumping into the ocean. This also includes instances of characters being idiots in order to progress the story. All of these things are possible because people can, of course, do whatever they want for any reason, even if that reason is nonsense. But they are as a result unnatural and therefore, if the show or characters do not acknowledge their ridiculous behavior, badly written. This does not include instances where a group of people collectively do something that fits these criteria, as I would consider a group of people being idiots to fall into a separate category. Put simply, this is when a character does things because the script says so, rather than because they would in fact do these things. The second category is a plot gap. This one is probably the least offensive, but the sheer number of these indicates that the writers are consistently establishing things without explaining them. This category includes any time when something that is plot relevant was not explained, but could have been. This, naturally, means that in future seasons these problems may go away entirely. Examples of plot gaps include how did Galadriel escape from prison the first time, why did King Durin III agree to help the elves build the forge, and how did Adar know about the evil sword being required to flood the volcano. All of these things are perfectly explicable, but that would require that we write part of the screenplay for the writers, and I consider each of these criticisms to be beyond what should be reasonable to infer. The third category is a convenience. Throughout my series, I have very likely used convenience and contrivance interchangeably, so I'll define my terms here for this part of the analysis. A convenience is where something helps the characters or furthers the narrative without those characters having caused it. In other words, instances of blind luck. This is where stuff just kinda happens because of random chance. Conveniences and contrivances are, let's be honest, everywhere in movies and TV shows. Even in movies that are otherwise very good, you will most likely be able to find at least one or two. Examples of conveniences include Durin's children singing the password to the Mithril Mine, Galadriel and Halbrand being rescued by Elendil, and the orcs tunneling under Bronwyn's house at exactly the right time. Much like plot gaps and character errors, conveniences are certainly possible because they don't inherently require any unfounded supernatural occurrence, but they are incredibly unlikely and therefore not a believable or compelling way to drive a plot. The fourth category is the more serious contrivance. A contrivance is when a character is forced into a situation that they would not be in if the other characters and world had acted as they should have. 
This is also known as a deus ex machina. This is when the world breaks, or when characters break, and this facilitates the progression of the narrative. Examples of this include the entire nature of Gilgalad's plan to acquire Mithril, the orcs repeatedly forgetting that they have ranged weapons, and Adar sparing Arendir's life unnecessarily. Contrivances require a substantial degree of mental gymnastics to justify, and I do not believe there is any instance where a contrivance is justifiable. If a contrivance is present in your story, it is because you have not written it adequately. The fifth and final category is good old-fashioned plot holes. Thankfully, these are relatively rare, but these are usually the most serious writing flaw. A plot hole is simply a hole in the narrative that cannot be explained or is contradictory in nature. They are similar to plot gaps, except that a plot gap can be explained, whereas a plot hole cannot. Examples of plot holes include Galadriel being able to be imprisoned whilst also being able to easily defeat multiple guards at once, the orcs inconsistently reacting to sunlight, and Isildur and Kemen surviving the explosion on the boat. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's get into the flowchart. Okay, so... At the very beginning of the Galadriel plot, Galadriel vows revenge on Sauron after he kills her brother. As this is our starting point, there are no narrative issues with, I guess, arriving there, but as we're about to see, the narrative issues are about to come rolling in. In order to get from this state to after centuries, Galadriel discovers the mark of Sauron in Foradwaith, which is the next, um, I guess, plot point in her story. She accidentally discovers the fortress, which is contrived, and then there are two logical errors, which is that she deduces that the Mark of Sauron is a map for orcs to follow, and her deducing that the Mark of Sauron is evidence that Sauron actually escaped. So, yeah, this doesn't really work. Galadriel is then sent to Valinor by Gilgalad. The reason why this happens is partly because Galadriel wanted to ask him for more soldiers, but the reason why he did this explicitly, he tells us, is because he believed that sending her away would help the elves survive because keeping her would potentially cause her to keep alive the evil that she sought to defeat. This doesn't make sense, therefore sending her to Gal uh, sending Galadriel to Valinor does not make sense either. At the last moment, Galadriel then jumps into the ocean. And the reason why she does this is because she feels like she has not earned going to Valinor, uh, but more specifically and relevant to the action itself, she believes that she will survive jumping into the ocean, which, if true, is not set up in the slightest by the show, so I don't think this works either. Then Galadriel is rescued by the survivors of a worm attack, including Halbrand. Um, this only happens because of the contrivance of Galadriel accidentally crossing paths with the life raft. The worm then kills all of the other survivors, apart from Halbrand and Galadriel. It is convenient that both of them survive, and the worm, of course, kills everyone else because they're not relevant anymore. I don't have a massive problem with this, but I do have a massive problem with this. Okay, what's this? We get we get somewhere without there being a a, a problem? Oh god. Okay. So Galadriel is then thrown overboard during a storm, but is rescued by Halbrand. I don't have a problem with this at all, really. Galadriel getting thrown overboard during the storm it, it isn't a problem, because this kind of thing happens all the time during storms. Also, they're on a dinky little life raft thing, which maybe that's surviving the storm. That's a stretch. Uh, but in terms of character actions, Halbrand deciding, or Sauron I should say, deciding to go in and rescue her, Without jumping ahead and getting into the specifics of Sauron's plan and how nonsensical it is, if we accept that he does not want her to die, then the fact that he chooses to and is able to save her does make sense. Okay, then, Galadriel and Halbrand are both rescued by Elendil. The only reason this happens is because of the convenience, rather large convenience, of Galadriel and Halbrand accidentally crossing paths with Elendil's ship. This could happen, I guess, but now at this point we're on two gigantic conveniences, but yeah, they compound as I've already been through. Okay, then Galadriel and Halbrand are brought before the Queen of Numenor. Uh, the only reason why this happens is because Elendil makes the questionable decision to return Galadriel to Numenor in spite of this being an act of treason. Uh, there are no real consequences for this, so why they declared this to be treason I have no idea, but either way the fact is, it is treason and Elendil doesn't seem to care. Okay, uh, then the plots diverge. We'll do Halbrand first because it's quicker. So Halbrand then uh, tries and fails to acquire a guild crest. The only reason why he is able to do this is because he accumulated a substantial amount of money in an extremely short amount of time, which I think is obscenely contrived. His plan would not have worked if he did not have any money, 
and his plan would not have worked if he had a bit of money. He needed, you know, a reasonable amount of money here. In order to distract 20, 30 people with multiple rounds of drinks, you, you know, that isn't pocket change. And the only reasonable assumption after everything that Halbrand went through being a shipwrecky and then diving into the ocean during a storm and all the rest of it, we have to assume he has absolutely no money in his pocket. And yet this uh, sequence requires that he not only have some, but that he has quite a bit. Uh, and then later on, he uh, teams back up with Galadriel. So then Galadriel, this is where things start to get pretty spicy. So Galadriel is taken to the Hall of Law by Elendil and discovers Sauron's plan and Halbrand's lineage. Here we go. So Halbrand retrieves Galadriel's dagger from Elendil without being noticed. This is contrived, although it doesn't directly lead, lead to anything. Elendil locates Galadriel at the docks. This is convenient because he had no reason to assume that she was there. I think it's reasonable to assume that he probably knew that she was trying to leave because he likely guessed or maybe was told that she had escaped. But, I mean, does Numenor have one dock? Elendil is then able to convince Galadriel to come with him rather than stealing a boat, which I've got written here as a convenience, but I'd say that's more of a character error because I don't. there is no reason why Galadriel would do this. The entire existence of the spy's account detailing Sauron's plan is incredibly convenient. Believe me, I would bump this up to a contrivance if I could, but I'm trying to be consistent here, and it's just the mother of all conveniences. It's literally a guy was here and had all the answers and wrote them on a piece of paper for you to find. Like, that, if that isn't convenient, then what the hell is? And uh, then Elendil having no reason whatsoever to take Galadriel to the Hall of Law beyond he... You know, he likes elves, I guess, as we find out later. So this here does not work at all. And, you know, if the world had acted how it should have, then it would not have happened. Okay. Then Galadriel meets with the queen and is subsequently imprisoned. This is the infamous Tempest scene. So Galadriel deduced previously that Halbrand was the heir to the throne of the Southlands, which is just some incredible logical leaps. Because from what we are told, she didn't find, you know, the, the convenient spy didn't have a second document that said also Halbrand's the king. It wasn't, it wasn't as simple as that. She found what she considered to be evidence that pointed in the direction of Halbrand being the heir to the throne. And she concluded that Halbrand is the heir to the throne. That is some fascinating logic, which does not line up whatsoever. And rather critically, I think, uh, this is not mentioned at all in the show, uh, Galadriel's plan is to recruit Numenor's army, even though Numenor does not have an army. Um, the only way this works at all is if her goal is, you know, jump off jump off the boat going to Valinor, get to Numenor by swimming, I assume. Uh, and the reason why she wants to get to Numenor specifically, rather than go back to Middle-earth, is because it's a bit closer by maybe, I don't know, a thousand miles, which means she only has to swim 3,000 miles or some shit. But either way, yeah, they don't have an army, which she, you know, she's got to be aware of. She's thousands of years old and she has all this worldly experience. But there's, you know, there's people there and I guess there are swords there. Therefore, that that's an army. Okay, then Galadriel escapes from being imprisoned and meets with the queen again. And this then causes the queen to decide to go to war. So Galadriel is imprisoned in the cell directly next to Halbrand. This is very convenient, but it does not directly affect this plot. It only affects the Halbrand plot. Uh, another plot hole. These are fun. Galadriel can apparently be imprisoned after the whole I am a Tempest thing while also being established to be able to easily defeat multiple guards at once. This, I mean, this is an impossibility unless those guards are just, well, special. Or if she decided explicitly to do something that she has no reason to do. So I, without splitting hairs, I'm just calling that a plot hole. Um, and again, another plot hole. Galadriel climbs the Queen's Tower without being seen or heard by guards when there were guards present and looking for her. Calling this a plot hole might be a bit much, but I'm going to offer a little bit of a defense. So um, we are explicitly told that there are multiple guards who are looking for her and they know where she is. That they don't find her uh, when she's climbing the tower is essentially impossible unless we just write in that the guards are blind. Okay, so uh, Halbrand then teams back up with uh, Galadriel at some point here. Uh, the Numenorians prepare for war, and Galadriel then convinces Halbrand to go with them, and they then depart. So, this is basically all of episode 5. So, Miriel is convinced to send an army to Middle-earth because of a sign from the gods. For now, I've got to say that it's very convenient that this happened, because we know nothing really about the gods, or Valar, I guess. So if it is a sentient being that made this happen, then that isn't convenient, because this sentient being wanted Miriel to go to war. 
but we have no reason to believe that from the information given in the show, therefore it's convenient. Uh, Muriel also does not recognize that Galadriel has lied to her. This is when she spent the entire time, like, bigging up Halbrand and being like, yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna help us and he's the king and all this shit. And then he's like, nah, I'm gonna stay here and be a blacksmith. And she doesn't even mention, wait, what, did you, you just lied to me? Like, why are you manipulating everyone here? She just goes along with the whole thing. Okay, there are also no guards guarding the Numenorean fleet, which is convenient as hell. Uh, Kemen choosing to blow- I forgot about all this. Kemen choosing to blow up the exact same boat that Isildur was hiding on. Uh, rather large convenience there. And Isildur just kind of coughing for no reason is also convenient as hell. And then of course the plot hole that Isildur and Kemen survived the explosion. You can get around this by saying, well, maybe they were further- far enough away from the boat to survive the explosion, but from what we see in the show, this is not what happened, therefore plot hole. Um, also, Isildur has no reason to cover up for Kemen because he can't know that doing this would get him what he wants, which is to go into the army. Um, if anything, he should turn him the fuck in because not doing so means that Kemen may then blow up all the boats, which will then mean that no one gets to go to war, which uh, Isildur very much wants to do. Um, and Elendil being a big fat doofus and being totally unaware that Isildur has lied to him. Um, these are character issues rather than plot issues, but they directly lead to critical plot developments, which is why I've included them here. Anyway, then the Numenorians arrive in the Southlands and defeat the Orcs. Uh, quite a lot of contrivances here. So the Numenorean army is able to cross the mountains in a day, uh, so we are told. The Numenorians acquiring an additional 470 horses. So I was thinking plot hole for this, but then I thought, nah, we'll, we'll bump it down to a contrivance. Either way, it's a catastrophic error, and I don't know how the hell this got through, but... For it to be a plot hole, in my eyes, it has to be impossible. And they could have they could they could have just arrived and found 470 horses. I get like obviously that's ridiculous, but that's why I put it in contrivance rather than plot hole. Uh, in order to make this a plot hole, it would have required that someone uh, tell us or establish that there are no horses just don't exist in Middle Earth. In which case, this would be impossible. Okay, also the Numenorians knowing that they're needed in Tiharad specifically, there is no way they can know this, uh, but. I, the reason, again, why it's not a plot hole is because they could have just guessed. And the Numenorians are also able to defeat orcs in a 1v1, despite having ever, uh, never fought an orc before or even seen one, and Galadriel not actually teaching them how to fight them. Uh, so, yeah, the first three of these are catastrophic. This one is, you could argue, a nitpick. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring this up if these three made sense. And uh, finally, we have another Muriel error, because she's fascinatingly intelligent. She does not recognize or acknowledge at any point that Galadriel was massively over-exaggerating the orc threat. She is not angry, she's not- yeah, there are no consequences to this, she's just, ah, oh, we killed the orcs and we're happy, we did what we came here for and now we're going. And then obviously, Volcano. Um, okay, the Numenorians then leave the Southlands and return home. I don't have a problem with this, the problem that I have is that they leave people behind, but those are character issues rather than plot issues, so the concept of the Numenorians leaving the Southlands and returning home does not require anything nonsensical to actually happen in and of itself. Okay, we then have Galadriel, this is after the, um, after the eruption. Galadriel travels to the Numenorean encampment, um, and in so doing, she saves Halbrand's life, supposedly. Even though he's Sauron, there is no reason to believe that this wound was not genuine, which causes well, it causes rather substantial problems, and it means that we simply have to be of the view that had Galadriel not got there, then, uh, you know, Sauron would be dead. So, uh, very convenient. Okay, Galadriel and Halbrand then travel to Eregion. Uh, so this requires that Halbrand survive six days non-stop riding on a horse while critically injured, and it requires that the horses are able to ride for six days non-stop. Both of these things are possible, neither of them are very likely at all. Both of them are very convenient. Okay, now we get to the Sauron shit. So Galadriel discovers that Halbrand is Sauron. Um, Galadriel is aware of the importance of the words key and damn. She cannot be aware of this. There were, there were no characters that could have told her this, so this is a plot hole. Galadriel then trusts some guy with world-altering information. So this is when she asks the dude that looks kind of like Ezra Miller to go and find information on Halbrand's lineage. And, I mean, yeah, she just kind of trusts him. I, I don't know who he is. But I guess, I guess she trusts him, yeah. Um, also, the explosion uh, in the forge when everything is exploding, that it's pretty convenient there that no one dies, or is, or is injured, I should say. There are, no, there are no consequences to the explosion, you could say. Galadriel also has no reason to suggest that they take a break, because she very much knows that they are on a very strict deadline here. 
Of course, the reason why it happens is so that Halbrand or Sauron can then have his, ah, oh, we've been pushing it too hard moment. Also, Galadriel did no further research into Halbrand's lineage until the script needed her to. This is a catastrophic character error, which again, I think only happens because the writers didn't explicitly show it. If you remember earlier in the Hall of Law, we see her finding the book that says, hey buddy, here's what Sauron's plan is. We don't actually see her discovering the book that says, hey buddy, Halbrand's the uh, heir to the throne. She does that off screen and then presents it to Halbrand. Had we seen that book, then this scene here would have made less sense on the face of it, but you know, because I have a brain, it doesn't make sense regardless. Um, the circumstances under which Galadriel becomes suspicious of Halbrand are incredibly convenient because it, it requires that Sauron wants to be found, essentially, and we have no reason to assume that he would want to be found. Um, Halbrand then reveals his identity as Sauron. Um, he seems to be of the view that she has boxed him in, and he now, it's like, well, the, game, the jig is up, we gotta, we gotta be like, hey man, I'm Sauron. And that's absolutely not the case, as I explained in my coverage of episode 8. The entire nature of Sauron's plan and his motivation, so I could have bullet pointed everything here, but then this flowchart would have been unwieldy. I mean, it's already pretty unwieldy, it's fucking huge. So for now, we'll just say, yeah, it's uh, contrived as hell. That should be red, though, not orange. Uh, Sauron attempting to manipulate Galadriel while she is aware when he could have done so without her being aware. This is just a, an interesting character decision because Sauron is not using the tools that he has at his disposal to achieve what he wants. Um, and Galadriel being unaware that Elrond could still be Sauron. This is when she pops out of the dream and is like, tell me how we met. And then he does. And then she's like, oh, okay, yeah, you're, you're cool. She doesn't even, it doesn't even enter her head or I guess the writer's head that that could still be a manipulation by Sauron. But of course, doesn't actually lead to anything because it's Galadriel and she's always right. Okay, then uh, as a result of all of this, Sauron leaves. Uh, I don't have an issue with that because why would he not why would he stick around you know he's got no reason to stick around at this point he's got what he wants and galadriel then assists in the forging of the rings of power so again uh, from a purely mechanical plot perspective there's nothing wrong with the transition from this to this so that is the galadriel plot as a whole and uh yeah it's pretty it's pretty fudged Okay, now we got one that's nice and simple. So we have the Nori plot. So at the beginning of, I guess, the Nori plot, um, she discovers the stranger because everything that happens prior to that is set up and the, the actual first narrative point on it is uh, that she discovers the stranger. So uh, from this, the Harfords then migrate and Nori's family are left behind. So the reasons for all this happening are heavily contrived and convenient. Lago injures his foot is convenient as hell. It only happens because he's a bit of a doofus. The show tells us that it happens because Nor because Nori wasn't there to help, but that requires that none of the Harfords help either, which I know that that's kind of in character because they're all dicks, but that is definitely not what the show was trying to convey. And the only reason why Nori's family being uh, left behind or specifically put at the back of the caravan is a problem is because he has hurt his foot. If he hadn't hurt his foot, they would be able to keep up no problem. Um, then we have the contrivance, which I, just, I needed to put this in somewhere because it pops up multiple times. The Harfords leave each other behind despite being a small, close-knit society. Uh, this is fundamentally contradictory, so it had to be here somewhere. Uh, the stranger revealing that Nori had been helping him. This is when he pops up and goes, Oh, Nori. Which, which yeah, it's the one thing we didn't want to happen. This is convenient as hell. He didn't have any reason to do this. He was just sort of accidentally stupid enough to do it because obviously he's not all there mentally at this point. So he just says exactly the wrong thing in order to progress the plot. Um, and Sadok deciding to soft exile Nori's family instead of decaravanning them. This is just a confusing decision that I, I can't get my head around why he would do this. Okay, then. The stranger helps Nori's family keep up and he defends them from a wolf attack. Um, this requires that Nori's family are both able to keep up with and then cross paths with the other Harfords, which is, of course, convenient, and the stranger being able to save Nori and everyone else from the wolves. So I don't have an issue with, uh, like, he obviously is some kind of magical entity, him being able to fight wolves or whatever with magic. That's not a problem. I don't care about that. The issue with it is that he was near enough to them when they were running around in the woods with Malva. Uh, but also, for some reason, no one else in Nori's family were. I guess they weren't on set that day. Okay, um, then the grove is partially destroyed by volcanic debris. This is just before they arrive. Uh, so the volcanic debris is able to reach the grove. This is not how volcanic debris works. It cannot travel hundreds of miles. 
therefore contrived, the extremely bad luck of the volcanic debris also reaching the grove, so even if it can travel that distance, the likelihood of it just sort of plonking in the one place where you don't want it to be, that would be a convenience. And what does that lead to? So, uh, the stranger is then banished after he injures Dilly and Nori in an attempt to heal the trees. So the only reason why this happens is because Dilly walks towards the stranger, because she's a spaz. Uh, the branch lands on Nori and Dilly when it could have, you know, not... And not only does that happen, the branch also does not injure or kill Nori or Dilly, uh, which is another layer of convenience. So, after that, the mystics, which uh, I had referred previously as androgenites, but, you know, for, for this part of the analysis, I'm going to use their proper names, even though those proper names are not actually in the show. So, they're able to track Nori's family without catching up with them. So, uh, if you recall, when we first see them... At the uh, crash site where the stranger landed, there's a load of footprints, and the implication is they're like, oh no, we're g they're going to track Nori or whatever and find her. The fact that they don't catch up with them until this point is, I mean, it's convenient. Like, why would this not have happened when they, before they started moving? Uh, they could have burned down the village before they even migrated the first time, but obviously we've got to fill that time in somehow. Um, Nori then jumping out of the bushes and revealing herself, uh, not not in that way, this is just an incomprehensible character decision. The only reason why she would do this is if she wants to die, I guess. And then the Dweller, who until this point I'd referred to as Feminem, uh, just kind of leaves after burning everything to the ground. No reason why they would do that, but they, they just do. Okay, then, Nori, Poppy, Marigold, and Sadox set off to warn the stranger that the Mystics are, uh, I guess, looking for him and they've destroyed the caravan. So, no one realizes that Nori has done anything wrong. Uh, this is, I guess, multiple character errors, but I've put it as a contrivance because everyone doing something that doesn't make sense is, that's worse than a character error. That's everyone being brain dead. Uh, Nori deciding to go off trail yet again, even though she does, should have absolutely no reason to do so given what has just happened. And Marigold and Sadok deciding to do the same, even though they have no reason to do so. Now things get spicy. Here we go. So the Harfoots locate the Stranger, who then defeats the Mystics. So the Dweller runs away from the Stranger when trying to capture him. This is a character error. The Mystics attack and kill the Harfoots when they believe them to be friends of Sauron. So I think we have to assume that when they destroyed the caravans, they at the very least injured someone. If they didn't, my god, that's convenient, but fine. But they explicitly kill Sadok. Uh, but they believe them to be friends of Sauron. There is, no, there is no reason why they would do this, and again, because all three of them do this, I'm not considering this a character error. This is a plot hole. This is contradictory to what we are told about them. Uh, the Harfoots were also able to catch up with the Mystics, and the Harfoots turn around for just long enough for the Dweller to swap places with the Stranger. Uh, this is things happening that should not happen so that the plot can happen. Okay, the Harfoots decide to rescue the Stranger because they don't know where one of the Mystics is. This is where they're like, oh, we better, it, there's two instead of three, now's our chance. It's like, no, you know that there are three, you just, you can only see two of them. So they make the baffling decision to go in and rescue them, even though one of them is not accounted for. Uh, the real Stranger is left entirely unguarded. This is contrived as hell because there is no reason why the Mystics would do this. Sadok is also able to restrain the Dweller. This is very convenient because not, uh, he can't have known that this was going to happen or, or that he wasn't going to get vaporized in an instant. Uh, the real stranger then wakes up just in time and arrives to save Nori. This is convenient. Of course, it could happen, but, you know, the timing is impeccable. Sadok literally teleports, which is a plot hole, and no one at the end of the battle asks the stranger to help Sadok, even though they very well could have and he at this point he seems to be like a normal person so he should have just jumped in and been like zap i've healed you now or, or whatever or explained why he can't do that so that, that way i'm not asking this question okay and then the harfoots return to their village and nori and the stranger depart for rune so i have no mechanical issue with this um it is is it the one yeah there we go it's the one part of the harfoot plot that actually makes sense Okay, now we got the Elrond plot. So, at the very beginning, Elrond is sent by Gilgalad to help Celebrimbor construct a forge. So, here, I know this isn't revealed until much later, but the nature of Gilgalad's plan to acquire Mithril does not make any goddamn sense, so I'm putting it here. Uh, the existence of the Rite of Sigin Tarag, I should have said this earlier, Elrond travels to Khazad Doom to recruit the dwarves. Um, the existence of the Rite of Sigin Tarag is convenient as hell, because if that didn't exist, then he game over and the plot ends but it does, so lucky Elrond, I guess. And then Elrond deliberately loses the competition in order to speak to Durin. Again, we don't learn this until, like, episode 7, I believe, but this does not make any sense whatsoever. Okay, 
Durin then agrees to help, and construction begins. I don't have a problem with this, the problem that I have with it is the believability or lack of believability that King Durin the Third would have would have allowed this to happen. Or specifically, if he did allow this to happen, he can't then later in episode 7, again I believe, say, oh we don't trust elves, we don't like your kind, and it's like, dude, you, you already trusted them. So, yeah. But that isn't what we are shown, what we are shown is that Durin agrees. Okay, then, later down the line, Elrond then returns to Khazad Doom because he is worried about Durin. Um, he is not banished from the Dwarven Lands, which is definitely a plot hole. You can get around this by saying that, oh, well, they're friends now, or whatever, but then it's like, why did the- why were the consequences of the Rite of Sigin Tarag so explicitly stated? Was it to manufacture drama? Like, obviously that was why. And Elrond deciding to then go and investigate Khazad Doom. The only reason he does this is because Celebrimbor's like, um, Durin's, uh, no, he's kind of sus, maybe. And then Elrond is oh yeah, I'll go find him. Okay. The next plot point is that Elrond discovers in Khazad Doom that the dwarves have discovered what he refers to as Mithril. And after this, Elrond and Durin return to Linden. So, Elrond spying on Durin, he has no reason to do, given that he explicitly does not care about what Durin is doing, which of course means that the whole reason why he is there is abject nonsense. The lack of guards guarding the Mithril Mine is convenient as hell. Uh, I find it fundamentally unbelievable, but uh, I guess the king is an idiot. Uh, Durin's children singing the password to the mine is also convenient as hell. This is on par with the convenient spy conveniently writing, Hey Galadriel, here's the answer to all your questions, and leaving it on a piece of paper for her. And Durin has no reason to give Elrond a piece of Mithril, um, which is a character decision, but again, it directly facilitates other plot points that happen, so I included it here. He has no reason to do this, given what Elrond has done to him. Okay, then, once they're in Linden, Gilgalad asks Elrond if the dwarves have Mithril, and Elrond refuses to break his oath. So, Durin risks everything to acquire Table, which makes him out to be an imbecile. Um, Gilgalad is unaware of the nature of his Table, which uh, I guess also makes him out to be an imbecile, or maybe he's lying to just be nice to Durin. Who knows? Uh, Gilgalad believing that the dwarves have Mithril, um, there is no reason why he should believe this. He he explains to us and to Elrond uh, what this godly mineral is, but at no point does he say, and this is the reason why I suspect that the dwarves have found it. It's just, it's a given that he thinks that, and we never know why. And Elrond giving the mithril to Celebrimbor is just a logical error, because there is no reason why he would do this, and simultaneously refuse to reveal any of this information to Gilgalad on the basis that he doesn't want to break his oath. He can't break his oath and then also be like, sorry man, I don't want to break my oath. That's not how that works. Okay, Elrond then reveals to Durin that the dwarves need Mithril and Durin agrees to help. The problem with this is that Durin agrees to help. Um, like I said in my coverage of episode 5, I think this is, you could do this, like it's possible for a character like Elrond to convince Durin to do it, but the way they did it was absolutely insufficient and it just makes Durin look like a gullible idiot. Okay, Elrond fails to convince uh, Durin's father, the king, to help the elves. The only real problem that I had with this mechanically is that no one acknowledges the prospect of war. Given how uh, valuable Mithril is apparently to the dwarves, to Gilgalad, um, both Elrond and King Durin should be like, yeah, well, war might happen as a result of this. That should have been on their minds when they were talking to each other, and no one mentions it. Okay. Durin then convinces Elrond to stay uh, against the king's wishes. So in order to facilitate this, Durin throws the mithril at the leaf instead of anywhere else. This is convenient, but, I mean, obviously it could happen because it's not impossible. Uh, the mithril slides across the table and then stops right next to the leaf. Uh, leaf. Again, convenient as hell, but sure, it could happen. The fact that this implies that Elrond at no point previously put the mithril next to the leaf in order to demonstrate to Durin what exactly it does, or to see for himself and to find out if Gilgalad was indeed telling the truth, he just- that just didn't happen, it didn't cross his mind in the, what, month-long trek from Linden to Eregion? And Durin then decides to disobey his father the king upon seeing this, which, again, you could do that, but I don't think they did anywhere near enough to convince me that he would do that. Okay, then Elrond is banished for disobeying the king and he returns to Eregion. So the king did not station any guards outside the Mithril Mine, despite being overly cautious and paranoid. Um, you could argue that this is a character flaw, but this is an explicit contradiction. The king is incredibly cautious and paranoid, and yet he doesn't care to put any effort in to guard what, as far as everyone here seems to be aware, 
is the most is the most valuable thing in Middle Earth. Um, also, the king enters the mine himself, despite it being extremely dangerous. It would have made far more sense for him to maybe send one of his guards in and be like, hey, go and check. But obviously they wanted that dramatic reveal, which is why they didn't do that. Um, Elrond's punishment for doing this is that he can just leave and no one searches him, uh, allowing him to get a piece of mithril out of Khazad Doom, which then leads to literally everything else that happens afterwards. It directly leads to the forging of the Rings of Power. King Durin not guarding the mithril, Elrond being allowed to leave and no one searching him, they already know that he's there to subvert him and that now Durin, uh, Prince Durin is there helping him. They have to be very suspicious that he has maybe taken something that he shouldn't have. What's he got in his pockets is maybe? But no, uh, no one checks, everyone's an idiot and therefore the rings of power are forged. Okay, um, Elrond, Celebrimbor and Halbrand develop and forge the rings of power. Um, this requires that Elrond knows that Gilgalad is arriving the following day, which he can't know, but I guess he just does. Celebrimbor is unaware of what an alloy is, which, uh, that is impossible, but, I mean, yeah, it, we could call that a plot hole, actually, because, yeah. Halbrand's arrival causes a breakthrough. Uh, this is very convenient, but it also requires that Celebrimbor is unaware of what an alloy is. Gilgalad can't have known about the effect that the volcano had on the tree. This is a plot hole because it is impossible. Uh, Celebrimbor and Elrond also take orders from Galadriel. This you could call a nitpick, but there is no reason why they would do this. Uh, Galadriel is not their superior, particularly Celebrimbor is the lord of Eregion. Uh, Galadriel is the- she's a military leader. I would have assumed that he would be in charge of her when he, she is in his city, but oh well. And the elves apparently do not have any metal from Valinor in all of Eregion. This is a convenience, uh, but this- the only thing this leads to is the symbolism of Galadriel letting go of her dagger. Uh, so I'm not gonna linger on this one too much. And finally, Elrond discovers Halbrand's true identity. So there is a large problem with this, but it is entirely character-based. So yeah, we'll leave that there. That's the Elrond plot. Um, pretty catastrophic. Now we get to probably my favorite. Um, whether I'm saying that ironically is up to you. Okay, so the first thing that happens in the Arendir Bronwyn Southlands plot is that a farmer asks Bronwyn to help his sick cow. This requires that the farmer turns up at the exact same time as Arendir, because if it had happened after or before Arendir had left, then Bronwyn would have been like, oh, there's black goo. Oh no. And then, obviously, like, she doesn't know, she doesn't have any reason to be suspicious of Horden. And if, Bro and if Arendir had already left, then, I mean, I don't believe that she would have gone off to Horden on her own. But, I mean, maybe. So that's very convenient. Um, Gilgalad also disbands the garrison to avoid Sauron returning when he believe. I mean, he, he turns out to be right but he believes that Sauron is still out there. This doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but okay. And Arendir concluding that the cow went to Horden because the farmer said the cow might have gone as far as Horden. This is a logical uh, error. This does not make sense, but of course he's right because the plot requires that he's right. So as a result of this, Arendir and Bronwyn travel to Horden to investigate. Then they split. So we'll do Arendir first. So Arendir deciding to investigate the tunnel on his own is retarded. And Arendir is captured in spite of having excellent hearing. This is a contradiction. This is therefore a plot hole. This should not have happened. Then, Arendir, alongside the other prisoners, is forced by the orcs to dig a trench. Uh, this only happens because the orcs are apparently repeatedly risking discovery by using slaves when they could just, you know, not. And uh, the orcs accidentally digging towards a tree that is goddamn massive and they could have just gone around, but okay. Then... Arendir attempts to escape and fails, but is spared. He is then brought before Adar. So this requires that the orcs repeatedly forget that they have ranged weapons, which is contrived. The orcs' reaction to sunlight is incons inconsistent. I could have put this fucking everywhere, but I put it here. This is a plot hole. You can't get around this. The orcs also massively risk discovery of their plan by destroying the geography of the Southlands. They turn it into a barren hellscape. Um, that they are not seen is contrived as hell, especially because... Uh, elves also have very good eyesight, but yeah. If you were feeling harsher than me, then you could absolutely call this a plot hole, but, you know, I'm generous, so we'll call it a contrivance. And Arendir doesn't defend himself from his apparent execution. This is when he does not fight back and seems to just wait for someone to save him because he knows that he doesn't die in that scene. Okay, Adar tells Arendir to tell the Southlanders to kneel before him or die, and Arendir then departs to head back and send the message to the Southlanders. So, Arendir's life being spared to deliver a message is totally unnecessary, therefore it is con therefore it is contrived that he survives. Arendir is sent specifically to Osterith by Adar is convenient because that is exactly where he would have gone had Adar just released him for no reason. 
And Adar knowing that all of the Southlanders are in Osterith. He can't know this. So, yeah, moving on. Um, and then he teams back up with Bronwyn. So, now back to Bronwyn. So, Bronwyn returns to Tiharad after exploring Horden. She unsuccessfully convinces them to evacuate. I don't have a particular problem with them, with everyone just sort of dropping everything and abandoning their village because one person is saying, oh, there's something happened in next village over. Like, I don't have a problem with that. Um, okay, then an orc attacks Bronwyn's house. She defeats it and convinces her people to evacuate. So, Theo destroys the floor, revealing the orc. This is a logical, uh, I guess, it, well, logical error sounds like an understatement. He he just freaks the fuck out because of mice and vandalizes his mother's floor. Like, I, evidently this kid has some problems, but him having this level of control over his emotions is not something that is backed up anywhere else in the show. He just flies into a fit of rage because of mice. Also, the orcs tunneling directly under Bronwyn's house at exactly the right time. This is ungodly levels of convenient because this could have happened anywhere else or it could have happened a day earlier or a day later but by having the orcs arrive right now it means that bronwyn can convince everyone to leave by defeating the orc uh the fact that bronwyn and theo are able to defeat the orc i do not believe that this could happen unless the orc is special or unless bronwyn and theo were overpowered uh and waldreg and the other villagers uh evacuate tiharad so this is specifically Waldreg because he's the only one who we know has intentions of defecting and joining Adar or Sauron or whoever. Um, Waldreg has no reason to leave Tiharad. The only reason why he would do this is if he wants to cover up the fact that he is evil and, you know, pretend to not be evil, go to Osterith, and then be like, hey guys, we should leave because I'm totally not evil. He could have done exactly this right then and there because the fact that Bronwyn has returned with an orc head should be some kind of evidence that maybe, you know, the time is nigh for him to get get Evelyn or whatever it is that he plans on doing. So when he addresses all of the peasants in Osterith, he could have absolutely done this here and saved himself walking to and from Osterith for no reason. Okay, the Southlanders then arrive in Osterith and Theo returns to Tiharad to acquire food. This is contrived as balls because the Southlanders did not bring any food to be charitable. They did not bring enough food. Okay, so then they team back up. Uh, Theo is attacked by orcs and is rescued by Arendir. Um, The fact that Arendir is able to save Theo is convenient. It's just massively convenient timing, given the distances involved. And when Bronwyn is on her way back to find Theo, the fact that they cross paths is also convenient. Okay, then half of the Southlanders defect to join Adar and half remain in Osterith. Uh, the problem with this, I think, is that Waldreg does not take the evil sword with him when he defects. He has no reason not to do this. Uh, but I guess he just forgot, maybe. It's entirely unclear whether or not Waldreg knows what the sword does. I think we have to assume that he doesn't, because why would he? But either way, he's left a a relic of evil, or whatever, however he would view this thing as, in the hands of a child who is uh, decidedly not evil. So yeah, he has no reason to do this. The only reason why he does this is to facilitate what happens in episode 6. Okay, Adar then attacks Osterith. The uh, Arendir then defeats the orcs and destroys the tower. So, Adar knows that all the Southlanders are in Osterith. So that's double dipping, I already mentioned that. Adar doesn't send the defectors into Osterith. So if you recall, later on, he sends the defectors in first. Uh, they have a fight, and then he demoralizes the Southlanders by making them, uh, by revealing to them that they have killed their own people. Adar thought that they were all in Osterith, and yet he did not send the, uh, send the defectors in first. Because, of course, then they would have all died in Osterith, and you wouldn't have had the dramatic reveal. So this says Adar, that should say Arendir. So Arendir kills some orcs instead of assassinating Adar, or at least trying to. He doesn't even attempt to. Um, he has the element of surprise, he's incredibly accurate with a bow, and he just pokes his head up and, you know, mows down two or three orcs when he could have put one between Adar's eyes and ended everything, but of course he doesn't. Arendir also reveals himself for no reason. If you recall the reason why he is there, the point of their plan is that he is going to bring the Watchtower down on top of them. This does not require that he reveals himself because he can do this by just firing an arrow out of the darkness and then running away. Um, the Watchtower also disintegrates after a single arrow, because it is a symbol of their strength, of course. Uh, the Watchtower also falls in exactly the right direction so as to cause maximum damage. Uh, Arendir can't have known that this was going to happen. Um, the Southlanders also decide to destroy Osterith in favor of defending themselves in Tiharad. This makes absolutely no sense, and because multiple people decided to do this, I put this as a contrivance. This would be like Rohan deciding, actually, let's we, when we get to Minas Tirith, we'll destroy it, and then we'll leave and go back to Edoras, because, of course, that's a more defensible position. That's just... you cannot defend that. 
And we then see that the Southlanders managed to get past the orcs on their way out of Osterith, because they're at the bottom of the hill where the orcs were, basically both sides have switched places and yet they did not cross paths with each other. Okay, uh, now we have a big juicy. Uh, so Adar then attacks Tirhrad, most of the Southlanders are killed and Bronwyn is wounded, so I'll rattle through these pretty quick. So Arendir concludes that the evil sword cannot be destroyed. He doesn't really try, he just seems to know that that's the case. The orcs forget that they have a tunnel going directly under Bronwyn's house, which they could have used, and no one acknowledges this. This is contrived. The Southlanders forget that the orcs have a tunnel going under Bronwyn's house. Uh, specifically, Bronwyn forgets this and doesn't bring it up. This is also contrived. One single orc is sent to check on where Bronwyn is hiding, which is convenient as hell. An orc with a torch is sent, period, thus enabling Bronwyn to trigger the trap, which is also convenient. Bronwyn remains hidden, despite being in full view of the orc army. Uh, the colors on these are wrong. This is a goddamn plot hole, not a character error, because this is impossible. None of the orcs see or hear Bronwyn fighting against the orc, which is also a plot hole, because it's right next to them. Uh, the fact that Bronwyn is able to defeat the orc is contrived. The Southland is also believing that the orc army consists of around 50 orcs, which is also contrived, especially because uh, Arendir specifically must know that this is not the case. Um, an orc is snuck up on by a flaming wheelbarrow. This is, I mean, he's he's blind. This doesn't, this one doesn't really matter, but I wrote it down anyway. The orcs know that the wounded and children are in the tavern. This is contrived, because why would they be there? The Southlander's plan also only works if there are no more than about 50 orcs. This is a plot hole, because this is not mentioned at any point. And essentially, this, the only reason why this is their plan is so that the plot can, of course, happen. Um, an orc manages to sneak up on Arendir twice. Uh, despite his fantastic elven hearing. Um, an orc walks around for a little bit for no reason before attacking Arendir, which he, of course, has no reason to do. The orc that I referred to as Big Chungus throws Arendir around a lot instead of, you know, killing him. And Bronwyn then rescues Arendir from Big Chungus's clutches, which is convenient because, again, her knowing where he is and her being able to sneak up on him, all of that is just convenient. And Adar's inefficient military strategy. I could put this as something else, but it's specifically Adar's plan and it doesn't make much sense. Okay. Adar then acquires the evil sword. So this is the scene in the tavern. So multiple logical errors. Adar knows that Arendir has the evil sword. He can't know this. Arendir confirms that he has the evil sword. He has no reason to do this. Theo knew where Arendir hid the evil sword. As far as we had seen, this should not have happened, especially because Arendir would know if Theo was following him. And Arendir deciding to take the evil sword and hide it inside the tavern. There is no reason why he would put this here, especially if he knows that this is their last line of defense, where he's keeping, or where they're keeping the women in the, sorry, God, that was a genuine fuck up. <laughs> I'm not even doing a joke here. Where they're keeping the wounded and the children. So therefore, worst case scenario, that is where they're all going to be defending themselves from the orcs. And therefore, that is the last place where he should put the sword because that is where Adar is going to be. Okay, then they, well, then we have Waldreg. Okay, so Waldreg then causes Mount Doom to erupt. So Adar is able to explain his plan to Waldreg in a few seconds. This is contrived unless he had already explained it to Waldreg before. But again, the scene is structured so as to give the audience a sense of mystery. Uh, Waldreg escaping an active battlefield. I will rescind that one because I do actually think that that's possible on reflection. The volcano erupting due to the addition of water. This is not how volcanoes work. Uh, this is a particularly evil volcano or something. I don't know. But either way, it's contrived that this happens. Um, the fact that anyone survives this eruption is a plot hole. You can't have an eruption like this that is so well, to use the word again, evil, that it just it just turns into a nuclear bomb when you add water to it. You can't do that and dial it up to 11 in that aspect. But then also be like, and nothing of value was lost. That That's not how that works. That's a plot hole. You can have one, you can't have the other. Okay, the Southlanders defeat the orcs with help from the Numenorians. This is while Adar's doing his thing. Uh, while Waldreg's doing his thing. So, the outnumbered Southlanders kill every orc in the tavern. I do not believe that this is possible, but it happens off screen, so it's contrived. Halbrand catches up with Adar. This is contrived because he ran off in the opposite direction, somehow knew where he was going and got there first. Neither Arendir nor Galadriel check if Adar did have the evil sword, which is of course contrived. Bronwyn is apparently mobile a couple of hours after being on Death's Door, which is once again contrived. This isn't a character error because she's not in control of how mobile she is, it's just that her wound is suddenly not that bad. 
And the Southlanders accept Halbrand as a king because he said so, they have no reason to believe this, and they also have no reason to believe that there even is a lost king given that Sauron made the whole goddamn thing up. And Arendir then gives Theo a child, the evil sword, after Theo says that he felt drawn to its power. Um, this, you, no, you don't do this. Okay, then. The survivors travel to the Numenorean encampment. This is where we leave them. Uh, they do say that they're going to go elsewhere, but we don't actually see that yet, so this is the end of their story. So, Muriel and Valandil, who I had referred to as Afrog, leave Isildur without checking if he is actually dead. Muriel is, of course, blind at this point, so this is entirely Valandil's fault. Unfortunately, because he was my favorite character, God damn it. Uh, critically, Elendil does not confirm if Isildur is actually dead. These severely injured men travel 20 miles through mountains. Uh, remember, th this includes people who have massive burns on the side of their face and people who have one leg. Like, no, this is not happening, but of course, happens off screen, therefore it's convenient. The Numenorians are ready to leave immediately after arriving. Um, I guess they just, it's as simple as jump on the boat and go, like you don't need to do anything else. Uh, more importantly, I think, uh, contrived as opposed to convenient, the Numenorians are willing to leave immediately. They're like, oh, we've just sailed into Hiroshima and then it's got exploded by a nuke and then they're going to leave immediately. They're not going to stick around. They're not going to help. They're not, they're, bye, they're gone. And uh, then we are explicitly told that a safe settlement exists and the Southlanders were unaware of this. So I have this listed as a convenience. I might rescind this because on reflection, they may not have been aware of this until one of the Numenorians, possibly Muriel, told them about it. So the question at that point is, is it reasonable to believe that these peasants in the Southlands are totally unaware of what lies beyond their borders? I think that is definitely possible. I think it should have been explained better, though. So that there is the, uh, well, that's the Arendir plot. And if we look at all of them, there we go. So, uh, yeah, the amount of text here is not necessarily indicative of which one is worst. Um, I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But uh, anyway, I got stuff to do, so uh, I'll cut back in with my future self. Bye! So regarding my categorization of the various errors, I have ordered them generally by severity. However, not every plot hole is more egregious than every character error. A good way to judge the severity of a writing flaw is by considering the consequences of that decision, as this may explain why this decision was made. As an example, the character error of Arendir deciding to explore the tunnel underneath Horden alone is far, far more consequential than the contrivance of Halbrand retrieving Galadriel's dagger from Elendil in a room full of people without anyone noticing. Arendir exploring the tunnel directly leads to the discovery of the Orc's plan, the introduction of Adar, and the deaths of multiple side characters. Galadriel getting her dagger back, whilst essentially impossible given the circumstances under which it occurs, does not directly lead to any other major story beat. It simply means that she has her dagger back, which only later serves to function in a symbolic manner. To further make this point, I am going to highlight a flaw with the Lord of the Rings. <coughs> there is a scene in the Two Towers Extended Edition which brings with it a continuity problem. This occurs when Legolas and Gimli establish their final kill counts from the Battle of Helm's Deep. When we last saw them, they were each counting up their respective kill tallies and this was only minutes into the battle. If you watch the theatrical edition, this problem does not exist because we can assume that their final kill counts were far higher or more likely that they either stopped counting or lost count. With the addition of this extended scene, we now have to work out how on earth they ended up with a final kill count of 42 across this overnight battle against an army of around 10,000 Uruks. It is possible that they each only killed this many, because many of their kills were off-screen, but is it reasonable to assume? I would argue no, because we have no evidence that would support this. Therefore, I have to conclude that this is a flaw. So the next question I would ask is, does this flaw matter? This is entirely down to each viewer, but I would argue categorically that this particular flaw is insignificant because it has zero impact on the plot. It does not matter how many kills Legolas or Gimli achieved, because it was simply a game they were each playing to outdo the other, which informs us of their relationship. If, for example, it was established that Legolas needs to achieve 50 kills to activate a combo and destroy the ring, then this would matter. It would at this point be relevant to the narrative that Legolas had failed to achieve enough kills. As this is, of course, not the case, it means that this flaw does not detract from the movie whatsoever, although I do see why this particular extended scene was removed from the theatrical cut. 
The world of Middle-earth is quite simply iconic. It is probably the most well-known fantasy setting. The writers of Rings of Power had an incredible and unprecedented opportunity to explore the world that was in many ways only hinted at in the Peter Jackson trilogy. The Jackson movies are a masterclass in depicting a fully realized fantasy world, but in terms of potential, Rings of Power could have done so much more. The Lord of the Rings explores the Shire, the elven settlements of Rivendell and Lothlorien, the two realms of men Rohan and Gondor, and finally Mordor. Although we do see Moria, it is in a state of ruin, and we thus only get glimpses of dwarven culture, although we do of course see more of this in the Hobbit movies. The Jackson movies also do a fantastic job of using maps to inform the audience of where exactly the characters are, which factions are friendly or hostile, and what obstacles they will have to pass in order to complete their quest. The various factions are all instantly recognizable. They are all extremely distinctive, from their armor to their language, their buildings, their customs, and their behavior. All of this adds up to creating very believable and very distinct factions that are easy to distinguish from each other. This is particularly important because The Lord of the Rings is a very long and very dense story with many, many characters and locations. Visual intelligibility is therefore extremely important. Howard Shaw's soundtrack also goes a long way to aiding this, which he composed over a period of four years and using well over a hundred leitmotifs, resulting in an incredibly complex musical score. The scenes in The Lord of the Rings are simply incomplete without Shaw's masterpiece accompanying them, aided due to the fact that the score also includes many of the different languages present in Middle-earth. So, those are some of the brief reasons as to why I consider the depiction of Middle-earth in The Lord of the Rings to be absolutely unsurpassed. Now then, let's take a look at the same world as depicted by Rings of Power. First of all, let's look at language. In Rings of Power, we have five main factions, all of whom speak English. In addition, we have Quenya, which is spoken primarily by the elves and is referred to as Elvish, and we also have references to the ancient tongue of the Eldar, from which Elendil specifically takes his name, although Rings of Power does not make clear if this ancient tongue is in fact Quenya or some other language. The dwarves speak Kuzdul. The orcs speak the black speech, presumably Adar does as well, and we also know that Galadriel is able to read it. Finally, Gandalf and the mystics each speak languages that are unnamed and are therefore unknown. Rings of Power does make some effort to make these cultures linguistically distinctive. Generally speaking, Harfoot dialogue does not sound like Elvish dialogue, both due to the accents and their choice of certain words. An example of accents being used to very effectively communicate the differences between the factions that inhabit the world is in Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. The Nilfgaardians, Redanians, and Skelligers are three of the many factions in the game, and they are all instantly recognizable by their use of language alone. They have different accents, different curse words, different idioms, and the result is that each location feels distinct from the others. When you are in Skelliger, the game makes abundantly clear via multiple perfectly natural methods that the people who live there are not the same as the people who live in Velen. Use of language is one of those methods, and this is something that Rings of Power occasionally gets right, but often misses the mark. As with the Lord of the Rings, the various factions do broadly have distinct accents. The Harfoots sound Irish, and the Dwarves sound Scottish, for example. However, all of the factions speak using supposedly complex metaphors, and of course we have Poppy's song, which does not sound like a Harfoot song in the slightest. Additionally, most if not all of the characters in the show roll their R's, which suggests that all of the actors maybe had the same lessons from a dialect coach, but no distinction was ever made as to which characters they would actually be playing. And we also have the abundance of idiotic and nonsensical metaphors that the characters repeatedly espouse. You know why a ship floats and a stone cannot. The stone sees only downward, but the ship has a secret. For unlike the stone, her gaze is not downward but up. We can return in force and sweep the enemy from these lands like salt from a table. But the tallest milkweed gets snipped. Calling a dwarf dishonest in her own home. It's a recipe for strong gravy. When I speak, his ears close up. I wouldn't dare stop that, not for all the salt in the sea. We cannot satisfy thirst by drinking seawater. What cannot be known hollows the mind. Fill it not with guesswork. What are we to do? The only thing we can do. Swim. You fell below the dust. Yet dust fears you. 
So as you may have guessed if you either watched the show or watched any coverage of it, the show plays fast and loose with things like distance and time. I have compiled some references to find out just how bad it is and what would be required to make it work as I assume it was intended to. So, in episode 1, the meteor containing Gandalf flies through the sky and is observed simultaneously by Gilgalad, Celebrimbor, and Elrond, who are in Linden, and by Bronwyn and Arendir, who are in Horden. Although we do not explicitly see the meteor passing Galadriel on the boat, we have to assume that this is taking place in pretty much real time, because when the meteor passes Linden, it is after Elrond has met Celebrimbor and it is therefore after Galadriel has been sent to Valinor. Meaning that this montage is confirmation that Galadriel jumping off the boat, Elrond meeting Celebrimbor, Arendir and Bronwyn investigating Horden, and Nori meeting the stranger happen at near enough the same time. In episode 7, by the time the Harfoots have arrived at the Grove, Mount Doom has just erupted, and approximately six days after that eruption, Galadriel and Sauron arrive back in Eregion. This creates a point of synchronicity between the Harfoots plot, the Galadriel plot, the Elrond plot, and the Southlands plot. First up, the Harfoots plot. The Harfoots set up their festival, then they migrate, and then they arrive at the Grove. We have zero reference for how long any of this took, so unfortunately this isn't particularly useful. Next is the Southlands plot. So, after witnessing the meteor, Bronwyn returns to Tirharad, which is a day's travel, fights the orc, and then the village evacuates to Osterith, which is an unspecified distance, but we do see the distance through visuals, and this map indicates it to be around half as far as Horden, so we can say it takes maybe half a day to get there. They were then in Osterith for a few weeks. We must have seen it in the skies. A few weeks back now which I will assume to be three weeks. Waldreg then defected and travelled to Adar, which I will assume took a couple of days, as Adar was in the rough vicinity of Horden. Adar then attacks Osterith and then Tirharad, which he accomplishes within one day, as it remains night time throughout. And the volcano then erupts after Waldreg opens the dam, and it would have taken him approximately half a day to get there. Therefore, the Southlands plot took approximately three weeks and five days. Next up, the Elrond plot. After witnessing the meteor, Elrond and Celebrimbor spend a period of time in Linden, then they walk to Eregion. We have no reference for time, but going by the map and other distances that we do know, this will have taken approximately a week. After spending a period of time in Eregion, they then walk to Khazad Doom. Again, we have no direct reference, but this will have taken approximately a day. Elrond then spends a period of time in Khazad Doom and then returns to Eregion. An amount of time passes, enough time for significant progress to be made on the forge, and then Elrond returns to Khazad Doom for the second time. Elrond and Durin then walk to Linden, which will have taken about a week, stayed there for an unspecified amount of time, and then returned to Khazad Doom. Elrond is then ejected from Khazad Doom and returns to Eregion. This plotline does not line up with the others directly until Galadriel arrives after the eruption. It took her six days to ride to Eregion, and we can assume it took a day or so for her to arrive at the Numenorean garrison. If we then subtract the week required for Galadriel to arrive, this means that the Elrond plot took approximately three weeks and five days, plus a lot of unspecified time in each of the cities. And finally, the Galadriel plot. Galadriel travels to Numenor from Valinor by a combination of swimming and sailing a tiny life raft. We have no explicit reference for time or distance, but this is referred to in the show as being a great distance, and Middle-earth is also referred to as a distant realm. Going by rough estimates from various maps, this must have taken a month at absolute minimum. The distance has to be between two and 4,000 miles, and a modern-day sailboat traveling casually will do this distance in three weeks or so. Galadriel then spends an amount of time on Numenor before Sauron is arrested. The following day, Galadriel speaks with Miriel and is herself arrested. Later that day, she escapes and convinces Miriel to go to war. Ten days pass, and the Numenorians sail to Middle-earth. This is a similar distance to Galadriel's previous journey, so we can assume it took maybe three weeks, as the Numenorians have better boats than her previous method of transportation. It then takes a day to sail up the river, and a day to ride to Tiharad. Waldreg opens the dam approximately half a day later. Therefore, the Galadriel plot took approximately nine weeks and a half day. So, as we can see, the problem is that nothing lines up with the Galadriel plot due to minor things such as sailing between continents. 
For the Elrond plot to line up, it would require that he spent approximately five weeks staying in Linden, Eregion, and khazad Doom in between his various journeys. This is definitely possible, but it is not implied whatsoever. Additionally, even if we are as charitable as possible, and we assume that he spent as long as possible waiting around at the start of the series to therefore grant the dwarves the maximum time possible to build the forge, this still means that the dwarves have made this much progress in about a month. I have no idea if this is possible, I simply have to assume that it is. And perhaps more critically, the only way the Southlands plot can line up is if when Waldreg said a few weeks back, he actually meant nine weeks. I also don't think this is reasonable because he is referring to the amount of time he has spent living in a military garrison with people he doesn't like and with no food. Referring to a period of over two months of near starvation as a few weeks is not something I find believable. So, in conclusion, there is no direct and concrete contradiction here. There is no single irrefutable reference that I can draw on to say that the timelines do not line up. If we assume that more time has passed than was implied or stated by the characters, then everything works. Which means that what I can say is that the writers did a piss-poor job of communicating the passage of time. Characters change clothes very infrequently, if at all, which gives the impression that little, if any, time has actually passed. Characters repeatedly have critical discussions either as they are leaving or arriving at various locations, and we quite literally never once see anyone mid-transit. Altogether, this gives the impression that Middle-earth is not a continent, but a rather small county or district where every location is merely a walk or swim away. Middle-earth is supposedly approximately the size of Europe, and that is of course excluding Valinor and Numenor. From what we see in the show, my impression was that Middle-earth is about the size of London. Now, I will quickly touch on the believability of each of these factions in terms of the people who inhabit them. Each and every faction in Rings of Power is incredibly multicultural. There is no way to distinguish one faction from another by simply looking at the actors and actresses. The result is that the whole world feels that much smaller, with nothing in the way of visual indicators as to the geographical heritage that these characters came from. We may see multiple different cultures in Middle-earth, but each and every one of those cultures are all equally multicultural, of course adhering to current year diversity quotas rather than any desire to create a consistent or believable fantasy world. The Harfoots are nomadic travelers who constantly migrate, never settling in any particular area for too long. Their society, being a beacon of multiculturalism and diversity, does not lend itself to coherent world building because the Harfoots are extremely superstitious supposedly are good at hiding, and devote their entire lifestyle and structure of their mobile caravan village to staying out of the way of other groups of people. We also have the Numenorians, who are an island nation who are apparently, once again, extremely insular and prejudiced against outsiders. And yet, once again, they have the ethnic diversity of a modern metropolitan city. Next, we have the Southlanders, who I would argue are the one faction whereby a degree of ethnic diversity could make sense. These are a disparate people who have lived in small isolated villages for over a thousand years following a devastating war. The area of the Southlands is very large, and it also borders on Rune and Harad, meaning that the people who live there could absolutely be originally from those areas of Middle-earth. Then things get a bit trickier regarding the Elves and Dwarves. With the Elves, we have Linden and Eregion, as well as Beleriand, which is only mentioned, but as far as I am aware, from what we are told in the show, all Elves are from Valinor. An Elf could feasibly be born outside of Valinor, but their ethnic heritage would necessarily be that of Valinor. So, once again, the Elves being as diverse as depicted simply does not make sense in-universe. To be more explicit, there is no in-universe reason why Arendir is brown. There is only an out-of-universe reason. And finally, we come to the dwarves. We only see the dwarves of khazad Doom, but there are references to other dwarven kingdoms. Given that the dwarves live underground, keep to themselves, and dislike outsiders, once again, the degree of ethnic diversity present in Rings of Power makes little to no sense. You could argue a case for the dwarves, and certainly for the Southlanders, having an amount of multiculturalism present in their societies, but for the Elves, Harfoots, and Numenorians, it quite simply detracts from the believability of the history of Middle-earth. 
So, given that it does not make sense for these five supposedly extremely distinct factions all having the exact same levels of multiculturalism, I find myself asking why did the producers decide that the entire cast of the show needs to adhere to diversity quotas? Well, there are a couple of potential reasons. It is quite likely that everyone involved in this show lives in modern metropolitan cities that are extremely ethnically diverse. Therefore, they wanted their version of Middle-earth to reflect this because they consider it to be both normal and a good thing. Because, as we know, something being diverse is inherently and definitionally better than something that is not diverse. However, if the producers decided that the show absolutely had to have an ethnically diverse cast of characters, there was an easy way around this conundrum. Use the various ethnicities to help distinguish the geography and cultural differences between the disparate factions in the show. It would make far more sense to, for example, make all of the elves brown, and make all of the Numenorians Asian. The Tolkien purists amongst you may be rolling your eyes here, but I will remind you that I do not give a shit whether or not the show accurately reflects Tolkien's work. I care if the show functions as a standalone. Giving Numenor the demographic makeup of Pyongyang would absolutely not be law accurate, however, it would be far more believable than what we got in the show. Thankfully, if we take a glance in the general direction of the source material, we don't actually have to worry about hypotheticals because Tolkien gave the writers an easy fix. There is a race of people whom the writers have decided to include in Rings of Power, as they existed at some point during the thousands of years Rings of Power is supposedly covering. These people were described as shorter and smaller than the other breeds, browner of skin, had no beards and did not wear any footwear. Yes, dear viewer, I am talking about the Harfoots. The writers wanted to include Harfoots because they lack any confidence in the viewer being able to enjoy a so-called Lord of the Rings product without including hobbits or any derivation thereof. And because the show was made by Americans in the current year, they also wanted to include an extremely diverse cast of actors and actresses. It would have made perfect sense for all of the Harfoots to have dark skin. This would indicate that they are racially homogenous, which makes sense. It would also be accurate to the source material, which although I don't particularly care about, this would certainly not be a detriment. And it would allow Amazon to tick their diversity boxes. Win, win, and win. So to speculate for a moment as to why they did not do this, my guess is that it is some combination of the following. The producers specifically wanted to promote multiculturalism as being a normal thing, of course forgetting that they are depicting someone else's fantasy world, and thus did not want any of the factions in the show to be racially homogenous. They lacked faith that the audience would be able to enjoy the show if it had an entire faction of brown people, possibly preempting some kind of racist backlash. As the Harfoots plot is definitely shoehorned in and has no place amongst the other three given the story that the show is trying to tell, they may not have wanted the brown race to be the shoehorned race, as this would not look particularly good. As Nori is likely the only Harford who will remain in the show going forwards, they didn't want to have season 2 and onwards be accused of ditching all the brown people, and so they spread the brown people all around Middle Earth. They also have absolutely no respect for the source material and believed they could do it better than Tolkien. And they perhaps didn't want the faction comprised entirely of brown people in the show to be the ones who are barbaric savages. Put another way, there is absolutely no issue with the dwarves all having thick Scottish accents, which was apparently a trope that started with Gimli in The Lord of the Rings. Similarly, there is absolutely no issue with the Harfoots all sounding like Irish gypsies. If, however, you were to insert Scottish and Irish accents into Numenor or Eregion, this would definitionally be more diverse, but it would quite obviously detract from any sense of cultural identity or location. Essentially, what has happened is that the producers have decided to prioritize so-called diversity and equality in their casting practices over creating a believable fantasy world. In doing so, they have been unfaithful to the source material, but I would argue more importantly, they have made at the very least three out of the five factions in their show far less believable than they otherwise could have. The history of Middle-earth as depicted in Rings of Power is... A confounding mystery. We get tiny snippets of information that are usually insufficient and occasionally contradictory. If you have read The Silmarillion, what I am about to say will probably be incredibly painful, but I will remind you that I am describing what we know about the history of Middle-earth based purely on information that Rings of Power delivered to us. So to begin with, the elves have what is referred to as light. Morgoth then destroyed that light. 
We don't know why, and we can only assume that he is just evil. Galadriel then believes that the elves started the war against Morgoth, which further complicates the circumstances surrounding him and how and why he destroyed the light. The war then lasted for centuries, and at some point Celeborn went missing and Finrod was killed by Sauron. Galadriel then hunted Sauron for further centuries. Sauron evaded Galadriel and wanted to craft a power over flesh, but was unable to, as some dark knowledge was missing. This process involved killing orcs, which Adar objected to, and he killed Sauron, or so he thought. That is what we get as a setup for the world itself and the primary conflict within it. Now, moving on to Silmarils and Tree Goo. Drawing purely from what the show tells us, we know that Feanor crafted multiple Silmarils, which are jewels that contain the light of the Valinor. They are also described as containing the essence of Valinor. Presumably, the Silmarils containing the light slash essence of Valinor are what Morgoth destroyed when he destroyed the light. The tree in Linden is also a symbol of the elves' vitality. We are never told any more than that, so we simply have to accept that when the tree goes bad, it means bad things for elves, without understanding the mechanics as to why this is actually happening. There is also the story of the warrior and the Balrog on the mountain fighting over the lost Silmaril. This means that one of these unfathomably powerful jewels ended up on a mountain in Middle-earth somehow. And we also know that the good and evil got mixed up with some lightning and zapped into the mountain which became Mithril. Whether or not the elven legend is literally correct, the outcome is the same, and so we have no reason to believe any alternative explanation. This means that Mithril is the result of good and evil being zapped into a mountain whilst in the proximity of a Silmaril. Celebrimbor's plan to save the elves is to, quote, saturate every elf in the light of the Valar. His means of doing this is by acquiring vast quantities of Mithril. What he plans to do with that Mithril is never explained. Why Mithril contains the light of the Valar is also never explained. And the final portion of history I would like to touch on is the history of Numenor. So, Elrond's brother Elros built the Hall of Law on Numenor. The king prevented the Hall of Law being torn down as he was loyal to the elves, although how he managed to do this after being dethroned by Farazhan is never explained. The Numenorians, with a handful of exceptions, hate elves, and this is the reason why they dethroned their king. We are also told that the Numenorians are the children of the Edain, although what an Edain is is also never explained. <laughs> Now, regarding the other part of Rings of Power's world building that leaves much to be desired is the exploration of the gods, or Valar. So, we know that Elrond's father convinced the Valar to join the war and vanquish Morgoth. This means that the Valar are moral agents capable of cognition. Why they were not already helping the elves fight against Morgoth is unknown. We also know that at some point the Valar lifted Elrond's father beyond the bounds of the world to carry the evening star across the sky. This could be metaphorical, we simply don't know. We also know that the Valar literally gave the Numenorians their island, suggesting that some kind of physical interaction took place. The people of Numenor believe that the petals of the White Tree are the tears of the Valar, and the king believed that the Numenorians had provoked their anger. The only evidence we have for this is that the Palantir told him. We are also told that the elves were created by the One, also referred to as Master of the Secret Fire. Is this One a Valar? Maybe. The show doesn't tell me. We also know that the dwarves were created by Aule. Is Aule the one? Is Aule a Valar? Maybe. The show doesn't tell us. So, to be clear, the show doesn't need to explain all of this, but the writers seem to have wanted to have the best of both worlds. They wanted to treat the gods of Middle-earth as ethereal, unknowable deities similar to the various gods in our world, if any do in fact exist, but they also wanted these gods to be moral agents who frequently interact with the world they inhabit. This also makes the motivations of many of the characters incredibly muddled and many of their actions incredibly confusing. This also means that the show is relying on people having read The Silmarillion to properly make sense of it, but the show is also omitting massive amounts of world building, meaning that book readers will be even more frustrated than the rest of us. Rings of Power also dedicates a reasonable amount of time to depicting racial tensions between the various factions. I'm going to detail a handful of these now and see how much sense they make, how they are used, and what they lead to in the story. The Southlanders dislike elves. This makes a degree of sense because the elves have been suspiciously keeping an eye on them since Morgoth's defeat, with the view that they may still be evil. 
It is narratively consistent for the Southlanders to dislike elves because they are being essentially punished for what their ancestors may have done. However, it leads to absolutely nothing, because none of the actions the Southlanders take are as a result of their views on elves. The only function this serves relates specifically to Theo's relationship with Arendir, as part of Theo's arc involves him coming to accept Arendir as both a good person and potentially as a father figure, in spite of the fact that he dislikes elves. The elves dislike the Southlanders. This makes slightly less sense. The elves appear to be of the view that the Southlanders are inherently evil due to their bloodline. The Watch Warden specifically seems to view them as little more than animals, entirely because of what their ancestors did a thousand years ago. I can understand someone being prejudiced against a race of people because that race did something horrible a long time ago, but I have more of a hard time believing that a millennia-old elf would have this view. This also leads to precisely nothing, as none of the actions taken by the elves in the show are informed by their dislike of the Southlanders. The Numenorians dislike elves. This one is not established or explained whatsoever. All we know is that the King of Numenor liked elves, but many of the people did not, so Farazon orchestrated a coup and they dethroned him, and replaced him with his daughter, who also dislikes elves. Why any of these players have their respective views of elves is never explained, it is simply presented as fact. So whilst their dislike of elves is actually relevant to the plot, as it directly caused the change in ruler before the events of the show, it is not explained or established as to why they have an intense dislike of elves. Meaning that the Numenorean dislike of elves is very much the opposite of the other two instances of racism, in that it is actually relevant, but is never explained whereas in both other cases it is explained, but it is not relevant. And finally, the dwarves, specifically King Durin, dislike elves. This is entirely possible, but again, it is not explained or elaborated on whatsoever. Does he dislike all other races? Does he have a personal grievance with Gilgalad? Is this racism as a result of his extreme cautiousness? We can only speculate. My guess is that in The Lord of the Rings, Legolas and Gimli don't particularly like each other, and therefore the writers of Rings of Power considered this to be quintessentially Lord of the Ringsy, and so decided that King Durin would also dislike elves. The problem, of course, is that the reason why the elves and dwarves didn't get along in The Lord of the Rings is because of their history, a history that Rings of Power was supposedly going to explore. But no, there is no historical explanation for this. It just all started with King Durin disliking elves for some reason. And finally, I will comment on the soundtrack. Broadly speaking, I don't dislike the soundtrack for Rings of Power. I think it is probably the best part of the show, although how the soundtrack was used definitely leaves a lot to be desired. Where Howard Shaw spent four years composing over a hundred leitmotifs lasting over three hours when played continuously, Rings of Power composer Bear McCreary created his score in around eight months, featuring approximately 15 leitmotifs. This is something I find interesting, although not necessarily an indication of quality. As someone who also writes music, I know that it is very possible to spend a week writing something, and then to write a better song in an hour the following day. The massive disparity in use of leitmotifs may also factor into the lack of cultural identity present in the show, as the soundtrack will occasionally just play the same tracks regardless of what is actually on screen. So although I don't mind the music in Rings of Power, it is absolutely irrelevant to 99% of my criticisms. The music could be the best music I have ever heard, and that would change precisely nothing about how well written the show is. Rings of Power uses and abuses multiple storytelling techniques to varying effect. The end result is that the story absolutely feels like it has been made to exist on a screen, rather than to exist as a natural or believable world. This may sound a bit silly. Of course a TV show was made to exist on a screen, what the hell are you talking about, random? To be perfectly clear, when watching Rings of Power, I was very painfully aware of myself watching a TV show. This is a fancy way of saying that the show didn't suck me in, but I think there is more to it than that. Many scenes in the show are written so as to maximize the build-up and release of tension. This is nothing new. Tension and release is in my view one of the absolute fundamentals of storytelling. But in the case of Rings of Power, nearly everything else flies out of the window in service of this. One example of this is that, with staggering frequency, the characters tell each other things that they already know. The only reason they do this is to inform me as the viewer. Therefore, this is an inefficient, uninteresting, and juvenile way to write a fantasy show. 
Anyway, I am now going to touch on a handful of storytelling techniques that the writers used. First up is mystery boxes. The writers of Rings of Power are evidently more than capable of writing standalone scenes that function properly. The problems come when those scenes are attached to other scenes, which is something of a critical failure point due to the nature of how narrative progression works. However, they rely extremely heavily on what has become known as mystery box storytelling. This term was coined by J.J. Abrams, and he describes it as dropping people into the middle of a mystery in progress, which leaves them wanting to know answers in both directions. This can certainly be effective, because it can help to keep the audience engaged and can provide satisfying payoffs. However, it can also be a cheap way for untalented writers to create a problem that they haven't worked out how to solve yet, relying on the fact that audience members will naturally want to know what the solution to the problem is in order to get that sweet, sweet dopamine hit. If you set up a mystery, and the payoff is crap, then the entire thing becomes an unsatisfying waste of time. Mystery boxes are not inherently bad. There are entire genres of movies that are constructed upon this very premise, such as murder mysteries. An effective way to do this usually involves setting up the mystery initially, drip-feeding clues along the way, and then finally pulling off a satisfying reveal at the end that has been set up, makes sense in narrative, and ideally catches the audience off guard. You have to stick the landing, because otherwise the narrative is a question without an answer. Providing a satisfying ending to a story is of course always important, but I would argue that it is particularly important within the mystery genre. One example of a TV show which uses mystery boxes fantastically is the Netflix show Dark. I won't spoil anything here because Dark is honestly unlike literally anything else I have ever seen. The way it tells its story is absolutely unique. Much of the show involves slowly giving the audience questions and later answering them typically in very unexpected ways. A mystery box is also very similar to another writing tool, the cliffhanger. Rings of Power uses both. This is very common for TV shows, but Rings of Power in particular I feel abuses both. A cliffhanger is typically when a story, or in this case episode, ends without resolving itself. In the case of a TV show, it is usually used as a dramatic hook so that the viewers want to return for the following episode. So I am now going to outline some of the mystery boxes and cliffhangers used in Rings of Power. What happened to Horden? Well, the orcs attacked it for reasons that make little to no sense. What is the Mark of Sauron? Uh, it's a map of the Southlands that Sauron likes to leave around Middle-earth for reasons that make little to no sense. Who is the Stranger? He, he's Gandalf, or at least he's an Istar, and we know essentially nothing about him beyond that. What is the Evil Sword? It, it's a key that was forged by Sauron that unlocks a dam in an elven tower which allows for the dam to be emptied and via the channels that the orcs have dug be funneled into the volcano in order to cause it to erupt in order to create a realm where evil will thrive which makes little to no sense. Who and where is Sauron? Uh, Sauron is Halbrand, and his plans and actions make little to no sense. What have the dwarves discovered? Well, they've discovered Mithril, and for the plot to happen, Gilgalad is aware of it because reasons. Who is Adar? This one I actually don't mind. Adar's history mostly makes sense, and introducing the character in this way is, I think, the only mystery box in the show that actually works. Why are the orcs digging a giant trench? So that they can use the evil sword to flood the Southlands and the trench will direct the water into the volcano in order to turn the Southlands into a realm where evil will thrive. A plan which is quite literally filled with holes and makes little to no sense. What was the vision of Numenor being flooded? This one is actually not answered this season and so this mystery box gets carried over into season 2. What is the message Adar gave to Arendir? that the uh, Southlands must pledge allegiance to him or die. This one actually kind of makes sense. The part that doesn't make sense, though, is the concept of Adar requiring Arendir to deliver this message. Who are the mystics, and what are they looking for? Well, they're three magical entities from Rune, and they're here because they believe the man who fell to Earth from a comet is Sauron. Very little of this makes sense in terms of travel time, and in terms of what they end up being right and wrong about. And there are also a handful that are not mystery boxes, but are cliffhangers. Then I shall have to ask you to perform a service. The Southlands are but the beginning. The elf has arrived. You're it! You're it! You're it now! That's four dwarves down there! Summon the legions. It 
this time. Don't go. All that awaits you there. Darkness. There is one particular mystery box which I would like to home in on in order to highlight the issues with this type of storytelling. In episode 2, when Galadriel is pulled aboard by Halbrand onto the raft, she already has intentions towards an army, telling him to leave the army to her. She also indicates that she has a heading, meaning that it can be reasonably assumed that her goal when jumping off the boat initially was to swim to Numenor, as absurd as that is and now her intention is to sail there with Halbrand. This means that it is possible that they were in the approximate vicinity of Numenor when they were hit by the storm, meaning that Elendil discovering them is marginally less contrived. It is still horrendously convenient that Elendil happened to find them, but because the show wants to keep Numenor in its pocket as a hook for episode 3, the writers chose not to have Galadriel tell Halbrand, we're going to Numenor. They wanted to drip feed it to the audience by revealing first that a mystery man has found them, and then finally majestically revealing the city. As depicted in the show, it appears that Galadriel randomly encountered Elendil in an infinite span of ocean, which is so unlikely as to be impossible. If the show had made clear, however, that Galadriel's intent was to sail to Numenor from the start, then whilst Elendil's rescue would still have been convenient, it would have been so to a drastically lesser degree. Therefore, the writers added a significant convenience in order to hide information from the audience so as to keep them coming back for subsequent episodes. So believe it or not, my standards are not high. I can and frequently do enjoy crap movies. I am not expecting everything to be a masterpiece. I was not expecting Rings of Power to be anywhere near as good as The Lord of the Rings because, frankly, movies of that quality arrive every few years at most. That said, given the quality of Rings of Power, I can only conclude that the target audience is people who do not care whether or not the show is actually good. The writers and producers are relying heavily on nostalgia by evoking similar imagery and themes as the Lord of the Rings trilogy, compressing the original timeline by thousands of years in order to insert characters that the audience will recognize, and by structuring entire dialogue exchanges in such a way as to tease dramatic reveals to the audience. A place known as Middle-earth, a cruel and cunning sorcerer. They called him Sauron. There is only one place it can be, the land of the star. The westernmost of all mortal realms, the island kingdom of Numenor. Now a sea guardsman, with a son if memory serves, said to follow him into the service. In our tongue, grey glitter. In yours, something like me throud. No, no, it would be... Mithril. In your tongue, that means wise one. Or... Wizard. Doing this is not inherently a problem, but it is absolutely one-dimensional and transparent writing. Just imagine for a second that they did this in the Peter Jackson movies. I'm going to show you a comparison between the introduction of Edoras and the introduction of Numenor. Edoras, and the Golden Hall of Medusa, there dwells Theoden, King of Rohan, whose mind is overthrown. There is only one place it can be, the land of the star. The westernmost of all mortal realms, the island kingdom of Numenor. Okay, so in the Two Towers, Gandalf is informing Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli as to where and what Edoras is. This is not treated as some gigantic reveal. It is informing the characters in the movie, as well as the audience, as to where they have traveled to and why. Conversely, when Galadriel reveals to Halbrand that they are in Numenor, the scene is structured as if it is a movie trailer building to some giant nostalgic climax 
whereby they tell the audience that they are in a particular location, even though Galadriel was presumably already headed towards Numenor when she took control of the raft, even though she had no reason not to have discussed this with Halbrand earlier, even though she must have recognized the ship and the armor of the sailors who found her. But instead of saying, this is the kingdom of Numenor, no elf has laid eyes on it for centuries, or something like that, she instead says, Another scene from The Lord of the Rings that we could Rings of Powerify is when Gandalf and Pippin arrive in Gondor. We just passed into the realm of Gondor. Again, here this line serves two purposes. Firstly, Gandalf is informing Pippin as to where they are on their journey, as Pippin had virtually no knowledge or experience of Middle-earth prior to leaving the Shire. Secondly, it informs the audience that time is passing as the characters traverse large distances across the continent. If this scene were to exist in Rings of Power, it would likely go something like this. Pippin, we have nearly arrived. We have nearly arrived in a place where no hobbit has ever been before. We have nearly arrived in Gondor as the music crescendos. I find this approach to be problematic for two reasons. Firstly, I dislike heavy-handed manipulation of the audience via nostalgia baiting. Secondly, arguably more importantly, it reminds the viewer that they are an audience member watching a TV show. Constructing scenes and dialogue so as to dramatically build up to specific references from previous books or movies is immersion breaking. <laughs> Rings of Power also falls prey to wasting a huge amount of time via inefficient storytelling. There are entire scenes that exist to depict one single thing, and oftentimes that one single thing had already been depicted. Minutes will go by and we will only learn about what this one character would like to do in the following scene. There is no overlap, and there is no sense that these scenes exist in any kind of greater narrative. You don't always have to accomplish multiple things with a scene, but unless there is a specific reason why you are not doing this, you are wasting time. Why is wasting time in a TV show bad? Well, wasted time affects a few things. Firstly, it means that the audience literally has to sit there for longer to watch your show, but it also directly affects the pacing of the show, which goes some distance to explaining why seven of the eight episodes of Rings of Power feel incredibly lethargic. Episode 6 is the only one that has any drive or momentum, and I think this is mostly because it deals primarily with one single plot, and the tension is able to therefore build throughout the episode as it doesn't have to keep swapping to a different plot every 15 minutes. Anyway, for an example of multiple things being achieved at once, let us revisit a film that is not only absolutely a Christmas film, but it is also the only good Christmas film, Die Hard. I won't cover the entire plot here, but there will be spoilers just in case you are the one person who has not seen Die Hard. So, in an earlier scene, John is on the phone to Argyle, which coincides with the terrorist cutting the phone line. In a mediocre movie, that would be the single purpose of the scene, to inform the audience that the terrorists have cut the phone line. Because Die Hard is a good movie, the writers gave a specific reason as to why John phones Argyle. I'm kicking it down the garage. What's the word with you and your lady, man? Uh, the vote's not in yet. The scene does not exist singularly to communicate to the audience that the phone lines have been cut. We also learn about three of the characters, John, Argyle, and Holly. Now back to Rings of Power, these aren't really mystery boxes, but rather long-term plans that certain characters are driven towards enacting, so I thought I'd include them here. There are three of these in the show. Gilgalad's plan to save the elves, Adar's plan to give the orcs a home, and Sauron's plan to take over the world. I have gone into a great amount of detail on all three in previous episodes, so I will summarize here rather than repeating. These plans rely on the supposed mastermind behind them having access to information that they simply cannot have. They are also structured in such a way as to maximize drama in a TV show, when they could have been achieved far more efficiently. Additionally, each of these plans require multiple moving parts in order to function, otherwise the chain of causation does not make sense. Now, returning to Die Hard for a moment, a major plot point is Hans Gruber deducing that Holly Gennaro is actually Holly McLean and is the wife of John McLean. Throughout the film, John's estranged wife Holly uses her maiden name Gennaro instead of her married name McLean. This, incidentally, allows the fact that she is married to John to remain hidden from the bad guys, but this is not the reason why she did this. Towards the end of the film, a news reporter locates Holly's house and her children end up on a news broadcast. Hans sees the broadcast and realizes that the children are hers due to the photos in her office, and he then sees another photo which reveals that John is their father. 
This sequence of events requires a few things to happen. Holly has to have a reason not to use her married name, which given the state of their marriage, she does. The reporter has to be able to locate the children, which given the resources at his disposal and the information he has, is believable. Hans has to be aware of what John looks like, which is an earlier plot point, and he also has to have access to the family photos, which is facilitated by him being in Holly's office, which makes sense as Takagi's office was on another floor, and given Holly's position of seniority, it is likely that she has the nicest office on the floor. And he has to be listening to the news broadcast at the time. Put another way, a highly justified character decision, a character using the tools at their disposal, and a highly intelligent character recalling information that we know they have access to all lead directly to a fantastic and satisfying dramatic payoff that heightens the tension for the final act of the movie. Most of this is not only possible, it is likely, given what we know about these characters. The TV crew subplot, the surname plot element, and the previous scene where John and Hans meet face to face all serve multiple purposes within the greater narrative, and no single piece of the puzzle exists for one single reason. If you will allow me to speculate for a moment, if this scene were written by the writers of Rings of Power, they would likely have simply had Hans open the drawer in Holly's office for absolutely no reason, and find a letter from her husband saying something along the lines of, Dear wife, Holly McLean, please remember to get milk on the way home. I love you, your husband, John McLean. P.S. Please stop using your maiden name. Gennaro, that's you. They would have in essence decided then and there that Hans has to find out that Holly is John's wife so as to escalate the stakes in the final act, so they wrote, and then Hans finds out that Holly is John's wife. This is something that is very reminiscent of many plot developments in Rings of Power, and I think we can all agree that it is a very lazy and deeply unsatisfying way to progress a narrative. Also, because I thought it would be funny, here is a list of things that happen in the show for which there are absolutely no consequences. Again, it is entirely possible that these consequences will manifest in later seasons, but for the vast majority of these, I would place a large amount of money on them never being mentioned again. There are no consequences for Galadriel refusing to go to Valinor. There are no consequences for Arendir and Bronwyn's supposedly forbidden romance. There are no consequences to any and all of the anti-elven racism present in the Southlands. There are no consequences for Arendir disobeying an order from the Watchwarden and from the High King. There are no consequences for Elrond losing the right of Sigyn Tarag, regardless of whether or not he did so deliberately. There are no consequences for Galadriel repeatedly escaping from both the palace grounds and from prison. There are no consequences for Elendil committing treason. There are no consequences for the entire elven garrison being captured by orcs. There are no consequences for Isildur getting into a fight with the Queensguard, getting booted from his horse training, or intentionally getting himself removed from the sea trial. There are no consequences for Nori's family being left behind. There are essentially no consequences for Halbrand assaulting four guardsmen in broad daylight beyond being locked up for less than 24 hours. There are no consequences for Elrond breaking into the Mithril Mine. There are no consequences for Galadriel breaking into the King's Chambers. There are no consequences for Miriel defying the will of her people by going to war. There are no consequences for Elrond allowing himself to be used by Gilgalad to subvert the Dwarves. There are no consequences for Elrond breaking his oath. There are no consequences for Isildur tricking his father. There are no consequences for Elendil repeatedly leveraging his position to help Isildur. There are no consequences for Galadriel not actually teaching anyone how to fight orcs. There are no consequences for Farazhan allowing a war to happen in order to financially benefit Numenor. There are no consequences for Nori interfering with Gandalf's healing magic. There are no consequences for Durin risking everything for a table. There are no consequences for Kemen blowing up half of the Numenorean fleet. There are no consequences for Galadriel manipulating Sauron into getting what she wants. There are no consequences for Bronwyn getting a woman needlessly killed. There are no consequences for Bronwyn nearly being killed herself. There are no consequences for Galadriel threatening torture and genocide. And there are no consequences for Galadriel concealing Sauron's identity and allowing the Rings of Power to be crafted. And I have also collated some questions that the show has simply not answered, 
As with the lack of consequences, these very well could be answered later, but I have absolutely no faith that they will be. Why must the forge be completed by spring? Who is the mystery spy who worked out Sauron's plan, and how did he do this? Why does the wind keep saying Isildur's name? Why did Sauron draw the map of the Southlands on everything? Why do the Numenorians despise elves? Where did the Palantir come from? Why did the orcs slash Sauron slash Adar wait thousands of years to dig the trench? Why do the Southlanders and Numenorians believe in a lost king of the Southlands? How does Gilgalad know about the Mithril? Where did the evil sword mechanism in Osterith come from and why is no one aware of it? And finally, why must the elves abandon Middle-earth by spring or perish? So for those of you who don't know, Amazon's Rings of Power does not actually take place in the same universe as the Peter Jackson movies. The reason for this is that the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies are owned by Warner Brothers, whereas Rings of Power is of course produced entirely by Amazon. This means that Rings of Power is very much a reimagining of certain parts of Tolkien's source material rather than a direct prequel to the Lord of the Rings. The series is not in the same continuity in the same way that the various Star Wars properties are, for example. This means that Amazon did not have the rights to use anything that was invented for the Peter Jackson movies, as that content is of course owned by Warner Brothers. A huge part of the visual style for The Lord of the Rings came from Alan Lee and John Howe, who both acted as concept artists for the movies. John Howe also went on to work on Rings of Power, whereas Alan Lee did not. Howard Shaw, who composed the music for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, also composed the title theme for Rings of Power, but the rest of the score was composed by Bear McCreary. There are also many examples of Rings of Power quite clearly trying to evoke similar vibes to the Lord of the Rings trilogy, as well as directly copying lines of dialogue, which I will play for you now. What is this new devilry? What devilry is this? He's one of them rangers. How dangerous folk they are. Dangerous creatures they are. There is evil there that does not sleep. Evil does not sleep, Elrond. Frodo has passed beyond my sight. She has passed beyond my sight. This salted pork is particularly good. Salted pork? Tables filled with salted pork. A scattered, divided, leaderless. His people are scattered, leaderless. <laughs> Not if I stick you first. They are coming. They are coming. <laughs> when did Saruman the wise abandon? Reason for madness. What are we waiting for? It is beyond our skill to destroy. No. You're going home. Do you hear me? You're coming with us. If Mr. Frodo's not going anywhere without me. Wait! We're coming too! She won't be alone. You girls aren't going anywhere. Not without me. He needs elvish medicine. This wound needs elvish medicine. A hit. A fine hit. Place 
instead of Dark Lord, you would have a queen! I would make you a queen. If you died in the Anok, always follow your nose. When in doubt, Eleanor Brandyfoot. Always follow your nose. We also have the reluctant Lost Heir character arc, Galadriel narrating the prologue, and Elrond being told that he can't do a council because council be what Elrond do. Additionally, the entire existence of the Harfoot plotline can be attributed to the producers considering Hobbits to be a crucial element of a Middle-Earth story. You can't tell a story in Middle-Earth without having the brave young Hobbit who answers the call to adventure. The problem is that this is like saying you can't have Star Wars without a lightsaber when you obviously can. The lightsaber is a superficial object within a wider universe. It is absolutely iconic, but it does not need to be a part of every story within the Star Wars universe. Similarly, hobbits are of course iconic and instantly recognizable, but this does not mean that every story set in Middle-earth needs to or should include them. The presence of hobbits in the story of The Lord of the Rings is something that is in and of itself remarkable, because Frodo, Sam, Merry, and Pippin are doing things that hobbits simply don't do. This is entirely character-driven. In Rings of Power, the reason why we have a hobbit who longs to get out there and go on an adventure is because the writers have decided to superficially copy something that they view as Lord of the Ringsy and paste it into their show in order to make it feel more like the story of The Lord of the Rings. The problem here is that Rings of Power is not The Lord of the Rings, much as the writers would like it to be. The stories are fundamentally different. Hobbits have no place in what is supposedly an epic retelling of the history of Middle-earth leading up to the defeat of Sauron. Of course, I don't know exactly where the story of Nori will go in future seasons, but even with the information that I do have as a result of season one, the Harfoots have already been critical in the progression of greater events in the history of Middle-earth. They do not just sit in their holes smoking pipe weed and drinking ale. They are actually major players in the history of the world involving magic, wizards, superweapons, and monsters, which somewhat devalues the idea that hobbits are the most unlikely creatures to be involved in such things, and the fact that the writers were unwilling to tell a Middle-earth story without including hobbits is very telling as to the confidence they have in their work and the view they have on their potential audience. All of this is to say that Rings of Power simultaneously is contractually obligated to tell its own story, as it is essentially a re-adaptation of parts of Tolkien's work, and as such should not bear any resemblance to the Peter Jackson trilogy other than in superficial details like names of people or locations, or any specific design choices that were explicitly described in the books or were created by John Howe prior to his involvement in the movies. Because of how incredibly successful, both financially and culturally, the Lord of the Rings trilogy was, because Amazon spent a quarter of a billion dollars on the rights alone, and because their ultimate goal is to make money, the show very much seems to be trying to have its cake and eat it too. They simultaneously want Rings of Power to be its own thing and exist on its own merits, but also they are willing to exploit people's nostalgia for the Jackson movies repeatedly, in order to pretend as though they are both part of the same world and of a similar level of quality. Again, Rings of Power and the Jackson movies are owned by different companies, so direct references to the Jackson movies can only exist for this purpose. One example to contrast this with would be Disney's acquisition of the Star Wars property. George Lucas made the original trilogy, which was all one single coherent vision produced by the same person. He later made the prequel trilogy, which takes place in the same universe approximately 50 years earlier. After Disney bought the rights from Lucas, they then made the sequel trilogy, amongst other things, which also take place in the same universe and as such are definitionally canonical. This is entirely different to what has occurred with the Tolkien estate and Rings of Power. Amazon did not purchase the adaptation rights from Warner Brothers, they purchased them from the Tolkien estate, but they were separate rights to those already owned by Warner Brothers. Therefore, we now have two entirely separate adaptations of Tolkien's work, one of which was incredibly successful and the other exists, seemingly, to capitalize on that success whilst attempting to tell its own story. If the Peter Jackson movies did not exist, or were terrible, then Amazon may well have still created Rings of Power, but they firstly would not have paid anywhere near as much for it, and secondly, they would not repeatedly reference the movies in a way that is just vague enough as to remind people of The Lord of the Rings, but also to avoid breaching any contracts. So, who exactly do the writers think they made this show for? 
It was quite obviously a cash grab, as Amazon paid massive amounts of money to buy the rights to a beloved franchise for the sole purpose of having a Game of Thrones or Stranger Things level series exclusively on their streaming service. However, this in no way precludes the show from any particular level of quality. So did they make it for Tolkien fans? I think the answer to this has to be a categorical no. I have mostly avoided directly invoking Tolkien in my videos, because firstly, I have not read his books, and secondly, I don't find adaptation arguments at all compelling. But even so, I have noticed many, many disparities between the original lore and what is depicted in this show. Rings of Power seems to be an excuse for mediocre filmmakers to have their time in the sun by giving them access to the incredibly popular intellectual property that is Tolkien's novels. But the producers quite clearly had little to no concern for adhering to the source material in any meaningful way. I can absolutely understand this being infuriating for Tolkien fans because the show simultaneously disregards massive parts of his established lore, but also requires that the viewer already have knowledge of that lore. Therefore, the only people who are going to fully understand the show, if that is even possible, are the very people who are most likely to be incredibly pissed off by it. Most of the history of the elves involving Silmarils, trees, black goo, and mithril is almost entirely a mystery to me. And from what I have heard, reading the Silmarillion only serves to make it that much more confusing due to all of the world building that was entirely rejected for the show. Was the show then made for fans of the Peter Jackson trilogy? I think you can definitely argue this. There are a great many references to the Lord of the Rings movies. There are very obvious attempts to invoke nostalgia purely by jangling keys in front of the viewer, either as cheap cliffhangers or as blatant wink wink nudge nudge member berries moments. The larger problem though is that Rings of Power is only Lord of the Rings in name and in ownership of certain adaptation rights. There is simply no comparison. Rings of Power is the last Jedi to The Empire Strikes Back. It attempts to be similar in terms of content, theme, visuals, music, and certain plot elements, but it fails to do the most important thing. Rings of Power fails to tell a compelling or coherent story. Everything Lord of the Ringsy about this show exists wholly on the surface. So, if the show wasn't made for Tolkien fans or for Lord of the Rings fans who actually care about the content of the show, this only leaves people who are either unfamiliar with Tolkien or the Peter Jackson trilogy, and people who do not care about what is actually in Rings of Power. They want background noise while they do the ironing. They want something to glance at every now and then while they death scroll on social media. They want something that makes them feel like they are watching a continuation of The Lord of the Rings, regardless of whether or not they actually are. And to be clear here, there is nothing wrong with having this view. But I have yet to hear anyone with this view, or any other, explain in a coherent manner why this show is in fact anything approaching well-written. This is a show where, at every turn, the plot drives the characters. The characters are in fact not really characters. They are themselves plot devices that service the whims of the writers. Many of the characters are entirely meaningless. It does not matter who the characters are, all that matters is what they can be used for. They do not exist outside of their moments on screen. It is almost impossible to imagine a conversation between Malva and Theo, for example, because there is almost nothing to these characters. There is no background information to infer, there is only their lines in the show. There are few, if any, consequences for the idiotic things that the characters do, because the world does not react as any believable or coherent world would. I was going to include a segment here about how I would go about fixing the show for season 2, but on reflection I have discovered that the problems are so numerous and so critical that I honestly think it is impossible for season 2 to be anything beyond marginally better than season 1 at best. Season 1 was Amazon's chance to introduce their version of Middle Earth. It has its own history, lore, geography, all of which has now been established. Even if they wiped the slate clean and killed off every character off screen, and season 2 dealt with an entirely new set of characters, they have still made critical failures with the world itself. Therefore, I do not believe that it is possible to tell a compelling story within Amazon's Middle Earth, because the rules they have established in season 1 do not allow for coherency. So, as you will no doubt know by this point, describing Rings of Power as not very good is a massive overstatement. The show is garbage. 
It is on par with Season 8 of Game of Thrones, although they are not directly comparable because Game of Thrones destroyed an extremely solid foundation, whereas Rings of Power has fallen on its face right out of the gate. So then why did I title the series Rings of Power is not very good? Well, there are three reasons. Firstly, I decided to make these videos after watching the first two episodes of Rings of Power, and my honest opinion at that point was that the show was not very good. It wasn't unwatchably terrible, but it was definitely below what any reasonable person should have expected from a show with the Lord of the Rings in its title. Secondly, the point of this series was never just to bash the show and nitpick every detail into oblivion. The point of all this, which I hope that I have succeeded in, was to be somewhat constructive whilst also being extremely critical of things that are, in a word, shit. I don't particularly enjoy listening to people repeatedly say that a thing is bad. I am far more interested in what works, what doesn't, and why. And it just so happens that in Rings of Power, the vast, vast majority of it does not work. And thirdly, I find Rings of Power is not very good to be an amusingly sarcastic understatement. So even if seasons two and onwards are even worse than this one, I will not be changing the name. Speaking of season two, I'm going to take a moment to discuss what I plan to do with this channel in future. When I uploaded episode one, I had less than 60 subscribers, and now I have however many I have at your current time of watching this. Point being, you right now are the audience that I did not have when I started doing this. This means that whatever I do next needs to firstly be something that I want to do, and that I care about and have strong feelings on, but it also needs to be something that will be entertaining for you guys who have enjoyed my Rings of Power coverage. At the moment, I fully intend on covering Season 2 of Rings of Power, although that will not be released until 2024 at the earliest, and to be honest, I have absolutely no idea what life will throw at me in the next two years. Regarding other videos in the meantime, I'm definitely not going to cover anything that is Star Wars related or Marvel, because firstly, these two properties I think are vastly oversaturated in terms of YouTube coverage, and also the sheer number of movies and series I would have to watch in order to properly establish what works and what doesn't would take a ridiculous amount of time. If something happens in Andor that was set up in episode 37 of The Clone Wars, then I would need to know that when I watch it, and I do not think it's worth the time investment, particularly when I don't care about Star Wars or Marvel in their current form. So what I'm going to do is make a poll and leave it up to you guys. If you vote for Willow, for example, then I will watch the first couple of episodes and I will decide if I think it is worth the time investment and if I think I can make videos on the level of my Rings of Power ones. If I don't think there's anything I can do with Willow, then I will watch whatever came second on the poll and so on. I've mentioned this before in a couple of comments, but I also want to be clear about something. I don't only plan on covering bad shows. If Rings of Power was good, then the content of these videos would of course be totally different, but I have no fundamental objection to covering good media. I do think that there's a lot more that someone can potentially say about something that is middling to bad rather than something that's just absolutely perfect in every way, but like as an example, the first episode of The Last of Us has just come out, and basically everything I've heard about it so far has been positive. So if, for example, you want to hear what I have to say about something like The Last of Us, I don't have any objection in making a video, provided I think I can make a good video on par with my Rings of Power ones. It may well be, though, that nothing inspires me until Season 2 of Rings of Power. I honestly hope that that doesn't happen, because I would very much like to make content between now and then, but I would also rather maintain a level of quality to my work, rather than dive into a series that I don't care about, and produce half-assed work for the sake of playing the YouTube algorithm. Given that I am to some degree hamstringing myself by having this perspective, a like, a share, a subscribe, a comment will all massively help the channel, even if all you do is comment thumbs up. So anyway, that just about brings us to the end of my series on Rings of Power Season 1. I don't think I have anything else that I would like to say, so I'll finish by saying thank you for watching, and bring on Season 2. I will be waiting.